<laughs> the pressure. Oh my god. Yeah. You guys are insane. This- <laughs> insane. insane. Wow. <laughs> this project fell apart because of COVID twice, each time shrinking the budget as it went because uh we this film was pre-sold. So all the budget that you have is all the budget you got. And twice we almost got it started, once in California, once in uh, Canada, but both times it fell through. And so we finally found a way to bring it over to a little home called Austin and uh, yeah. pulled out, well, believe it or not, pulled out a lot of our Red 11 tricks on this one. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur: how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Racer Max and Rebel Rodriguez. How are you guys doing? Hey, doing great. great. Thanks for this. Really excited. Thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. I, I am, I have, as I was telling you before, obviously a lot of people who ever watched the show knows I'm a huge fan of, of your dad. Uh, oh, and you. uh, But I'm also a fan of what you guys have been doing uh, with him and, and seeing you grow, literally. <laughs> <laughs> literally seeing you grow as... As filmmakers, as actors, as composers, as producers, as writers, um, it has been it's been fascinating to see your guys' journey as well. Um, so I have to ask you my first question is because everybody listening is gonna want to know what is it like growing up on movie sets? Like, I mean, I you know, first movie set I walked onto was when I was in college, and that's not really a movie set. Mm-hmm. I mean, you were walking around with movie stars. You know, who you were like, oh, that's just that person. What was it like <laughs> for you two kind of growing up in this kind of environment? And I kind of protect an environment as well because, you know, Elizabeth, your, your your mom's been on the show as well. And I know how protective she's been with, you know, to protect you from uh, the less uh, the less nice people in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah, she was definitely the uh, the Mama curator Bear. and guardian. Mama Bear. <laughs> the, yeah, that made it all allowed us to have just a wonderful experience growing up. To be honest, it's a lot like growing up normally as if your parents do any other kind of job. But uh, Mm -hmm. you don't realize till later that you're in an industry that's so different and wild and crazy to, you know, as us as kids, you're just running around playing hide and seek and you run past some crazy costume people as you're hiding under the producer's desk or uh, the accountant's desk. And and they're helping you hide while they're trying to manage an entire crazy army show that's going on. Uh, It's (laughs) it's pretty much that. And and. with the cat, you know, as you you meet these famous who you recognize as now famous as when you grow up, but uh, to when you're a kid, that's just oh, that's just Uncle Bruce. Oh, there's uh, <laughs> there's uh, uh, Uncle Manicio. You can just call him Uncle Benny. You know? <laughs> so you you just kind of get a normal childhood, especially with someone like our mother who's, who was very protective of us and helped ensure that it was just a wonderful experience. So yeah, that's that's that what it was like growing up. So when you guys were and and, and I'll, I'll let you talk in a second, uh, Rebel. When, when what was it like when you discovered, oh, oh, this isn't normal. Uh, <laughs> like oh, oh, that Uncle Benicio just won an Oscar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. yeah. Why? When you had that realization, what was that like for both of you? Like when I hit, because I'm assuming that hit at a certain point when you got older. Yeah. Yep. Go for it, yeah, Rebel. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, it was definitely all the props, you know, you kind of see as you're running past them as a kid, people like remarking on them like, oh, wow, that's this and that. And as we started to see some of the movies your dad made, I mean, obviously, we didn't see them for a long time other than like Spy Kids and Shark Boy and Lava Girl <laughs> and stuff. For good reason, when you start yes. to hear people like remark on it, and it's like, oh, it's like a thing. People really like, this is like a huge thing for them, kind of like how for us, Spy Kids vehicles are like a big thing. And so, you know, the, they had the, ele- the electric chair from Sin City. We never quite w- knew what it was, but it was like, you know, that's kind no, of a huge that. deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had the, the uh, like, a, there's like a great wax figure of, uh, of, um, of Bruce Willis there. As hard again and it always freaked us out as kids like he's just kind of staring at you but it now you know you see the poster as adults and we're like dude that's just so iconic and cool and you know it was just as impressionable as a kid even if you didn't fully understand what it was but no yeah. but since, well, yeah, i mean definitely... sin, sin city when you walk when you watch sin city for the first time when that first came out people don't get it there's nothing yeah. in film history that had ever been shot like that ever yeah nothing like just that ever nothing yeah. ever like Super, that it was yeah it was insane man it's insane so, all right, so let me ask you this. So, 
So then when you guys first, um, so you, you know, you're growing up, Uncle Bruce, <laughs> Uncle Monizio, <laughs> all these kind of guys, um, at a certain point, you're able to watch some of your dad's early work. So what was it like watching Ed Mariachi for the very first time? Oh, man, it was really, really impressive. And what's funny is we held it off for so long. It wasn't until we were, you know, getting in the late teens, kind of at the end of mm-hmm. high school. And from then on out, you're out of school and you've got to figure out what it is that you want to do. And we had an inkling that we wanted to create and uh, be in the creative space, whether that was right. filmmaking or anything else. But watching that for the first time, it was just mind blowing to see how much you could step out and accomplish and to see that it's our dad who we've known our whole lives and we love him. He's super, he's a funny, great father, but to see like, wow, how smart and how little he had then yet how smart he was and just how perseverant he was that with absolutely nothing, you can go and create something incredible that uh, sets off a, not only a lifetime career, but at the same time, an entire wave that inspires so many people across the world for decades. And yeah, the, yeah, that, definitely. It was really just an impressive moment and really inspiring of like, oh, we're at his age. We too can go off and do something like this. And awesome. we too can conquer and accomplish just like he did. So that's really what it was the first time. How about you? Yeah, it's, it was cool. It's, uh, you know, we grew up with a lot of the wisdom that he kind of injected in the way he worked and also in like his books, like, you know, Rebel Without a Crew. Um, so we'd always kind of heard, you know, wor- when you're making something, work with what you have, not with what you need and all that kind of stuff. But then when we watched it, it was cool to see like everything he's kind of told us through the years that we thought was just like dad wisdom was like, you know, how he kind of did it. And it was incredible to see it in action and see the results you get from it. It was really really inspiring and cool did you did you either of you ever just go the old man just doesn't know what he's talking about like he i know better i mean look i mean i did i mean every every son (laughs) does that to their dad at one point like that's the old way of doing it dad you don't really know we we're 19 we know life (laughs) we know what's up yeah absolutely everybody has that yeah and you know it's kind of more sobering when you uh think that for a second I'm like oh yeah i'm gonna say that but then you walk past poster after poster after poster of like mm, maybe I, the pudding, me man. That. <laughs> you know what else he taught me to be humble and look at other people's point of views so i think i'm gonna channel that a little bit <laughs> so there have been a few very few moments of that. Yeah. But, yeah. many thoughts many, very few moments many thoughts. <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah. that's the way to put it <laughs> how about you how about you rebel same thing yeah pretty much pretty much i mean it was also another thing is we grew up right at the like the era of the game boy advance and like the ds and like all the video uh-huh. game kind of stuff so we're always like man but our video games are different this is our kind of stuff we're into and all that and but spy kids still always kind of captured that in a way to where we were like i mean we we never thought it weird that movies could so well capture what kids were into in that era until you see some yeah. other things it's like right it just really didn't have that that right. was that whole thing but you still had that feeling of like ah, i don't know we have this in our thing and you don't even realize all of it's inspired by well guess who you know <laughs> him and many other filmmakers so it's like you know yeah you know you know it's fascinating <laughs> because I, when when mariachi came out i was a, i'm only probably about five or six years younger than you dad so i was right. in high school Wow. Uh, I was working wow. at a video store wow. and that's the vi- behind me. That's the video store poster that I kept all <laughs> wow, these years. Awesome. Wow. Mariachi. Cool. Yes, that's a mariachi poster. I have two, by the way. I stole two from my store. He was the only Latino filmmaker that I could even, yeah. there, there were no Latino. I mean, there were, but there were no real out there Latino filmmakers like he was. And, yeah, um, for sure. and, Mar- and, Mar- and for people, can you just explain to people, from your point of view, uh, you know, from my point of view, Mariachi is that movie that you said it started, it, it launched a, an independent film revolution. People yeah. still talk about it like a myth. Like there was this, <laughs> once there was this dude who made a $7,000 movie and then he, and he, then he got into Hollywood. Like it's a, it's a mythical story that they tell in the corners of film schools around the world yeah, to this, sure. <laughs> to this, to this day. Um, and I always tell people, cause this, this is something I have a, this is one of the things I, I brought the show up. I started the show up was because I wanted to tell people how to avoid, um, pitfalls in the industry. And, you know, Robert and your mom both fell into a lot of those pitfalls along the way. And they were kind of mm-hmm. thrust into a world that this, they, you know, Robert wasn't even thinking this was going to go to the Latino Mexican film video mm-hmm. market. It was not yeah. supposed to be the thing, but 
a lot of people were like, oh, you know, I'm going to make a $7,000 movie. I'm like, that's great. It's 2023. <laughs> it's a little different now. The market's a yeah. little different. The world's a little different than it was before. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to say that again and again. Like, this is not 1991 anymore. It's not 1999 anymore. It's not 20 2009 anymore. Yeah. It's 2023. From your point of view, how do you think the legacy of Mariachi uh, has kind of continued and do you guys agree with me that a lot of filmmakers listen they're like oh i'm gonna go and make it go make it you know but understand R robert's path was robert's, no you know yeah. people try to re to redo that path like you know yeah. or, Qu or quentin's path or kevin smith's path or richard yeah. linkletter's path it's insane <laughs> so from your point of yeah. view what do you guys think absolutely uh first off absolutely agree and love that about uh you and your work that you've kind of taken that ethos and have always updated it for people now of like how to take that drive that that movie and that myth inspires in people to go create and helping them adapt it to uh the current day the current era and to avoid as you said avoid pitfalls that now we have the knowledge and foresight to be able to avoid so i've always really liked that about uh about your work oh well, appreciate and, it uh, <laughs> uh but yeah what it so agree on that first off, but then totally. But what I've always saw from it is that he got a very specific path through what, you know, it's so many things that happened and came together all at the same time for that passion and drive and what he went through to equate to uh, what it led to. But I always see that the thing that inspires people the most is kind of the timeless aspects of it the idea of uh, perseverance and creativity under restriction, intense restriction, and the attitude that put that drive and passion into whatever it is that you love. And you can create something that will turn heads, that will get attention, that people will, will like and want to follow you for, and that can inspire people you've never even met. So that's why I, I always love when people outside of the film industry that read the book or heard the myth and went off to go do things that have nothing to do with film, but just whether it's uh, uh, business or even account, we've heard accounting before as well, like so many different fields that were inspired by that idea. So that's what's really cool to me is uh, there's something you can adapt to it to modern times, but yet there's this timeless aspects almost of that myth. So. Yeah, it's a, there's a time almost timeless aspect of that. What it really captured was that it doesn't take a budget of that huge a size to create great quality work and great quality story. And especially if you write and you work with what you have and work with the limitations you do have, rather than trying to do something that's going to be outside of the your uh, scope or possibility at the moment financially, you can create something that turns heads and is really like, you know, blockbuster, remarkable level work with very little. And that will, that, you know, can do a lot. And usually quality like that doesn't go unnoticed for very long. So it starts to it starts to make the rounds, make make waves and stuff. So very true. Really important part of it. Now, Rebel, uh, you did a little movie years ago when you were five um, uh, <laughs> called Shark: uh, The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. And uh, I, I mean, I know how you were cast, but how did you even uh, like want to do it? Were you even thinking of acting at that point? You know, you know what? How did that even? Because look, man. <laughs> One thing is to jump around the set and play around and like, oh, Uncle Bruce and all that stuff. But to be in front of the camera, be this even for the small part that you played, I I saw that. I was like, man, that kid's got some cojones. I mean, he's up there with with the, with the with the, with, with, with the, the things on the, the the scales on the side. Oh, of the scale, yeah. The whole thing, man. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So you have to look back a bit to Spy Kids 1, Spy Kids 2. I was the this is where it really started was Spy Kids 1. I was the baby on the front of the magazine. Uh Carly Georgina's reading and when, when she's in the airport two spies who fell in love story that's me on there that's where it started spike gets two when like the magnum men attack at the banquet the OSS banquet and they're fighting the bad guys um one of the kids takes down one of the guys and uh that's my oldest brother rocket the next one comes along and grabs him too that's racer so the next one down the line and then I come running out and I kick the guy in the side and that's me and uh <laughs> I don't know. Our dad's always been a filmmaker, even outside of film. He loves taking home videos of us and stuff. Oh, yeah. We have like whole archives of he just loved filming us, too. He thought it was just so interesting, you know, kind of brings back the bedhead kind of days of that. That short yeah. film of it. Yeah, so, yeah. 
Um, we've always just kind of been used to the idea that there's a camera like right here sometimes for whatever reason. And so it didn't feel like that big of a transition to just be like, well, it's just the other camera here at the place. And there's a bunch of people looking at you while you do <laughs> something, you know, it's, and they tell everyone quiet on set, which you've heard a lot if you're running around there. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty natural. It was just I liked the story he made and I was like, I want to be in it, too. You know, because that's how kids are. <laughs> Your brother's <laughs> got it. You want it, too. So <laughs> Obvi ob it obviously, obviously, I didn't so see coming that they would put me up on wires and stuff to simulate the swimming parts and things and spray me with water and all that. Once I learned how hard it was and I was freezing up there and I was doing my own stunts, I was, was actually even a funny moment where they've got me up there on the wires and I'm there yelling. Well, how come I have to do my own stunts? <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, so very quickly learned it's not not quite as easy as it seems. But I mean, it was very natural to us, considering we just always kind of had a camera in front of us all the time. So it's like, oh, so well, you know, they just throw so you into the movie and that's how it goes. And it's like, so, OK, so, cool. you t so you're telling me that the film industry is not glamorous. Is that is that <laughs> it's not it's don't you guys all just eat lobster at lunch all day and sit around? Isn't that, isn't that the way it works? <laughs> it was surprising to a five and seven year old, but it wasn't glamorous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. we quickly found. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, and, and so it sounds like your, your parents were pretty much programming you since birth uh, to, to like <laughs> subtly, hip, hypnotically. <laughs> Looking funny, back at it, I mean, a little bit to some extent, but it's like that wasn't even the attention either. <laughs> right. No, yeah. no, subtle. They're very smart, both of them. Yeah. They're, they're just they're subtly. Exactly. It was very like, <laughs> subtle. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they never wanted to pressure us into doing anything, which was pretty cool. But so yeah. if there was hypnotism, it was very subtle. <laughs> it was very subtle. Yeah. It was very it subtle. It was more than anything. They were excited to show us what they do. And I think that's really special, you know. That of yeah. course, man, of course. Like any any parent would be wanting to show, like, hey, look what I do. I just happen to make cool movies, you yeah. know, and have cool things happening around you. That's awesome. Now, I yeah. wanted to talk to you both about Red Eleven. Because oh, when yes. I heard about Red Eleven, and for people who don't know, please explain to who what Red Eleven is. But when I heard about Red Eleven, I was so excited. I was like, oh, oh, the goat is going back. He's gonna go back <laughs> to do it to do to do another seven thousand dollar movie. And he's bringing the boys with him. So, <laughs> so t can you tell people what Red Eleven was? Absolutely, Red Eleven is one of our favorite projects. So, this myth we keep talking about, El Mariachi, made for seven thousand dollars in the nineties for the twentieth twenty fifth anniversary of that movie. Robert wanted to go back and make a film for seven thousand dollars again. No crew or one other crew member, no money try to do it all in one location and shoot it all in 14 days, just like he did on the original of Mariachi. And so he thought, oh, my one crew member, I'm going to bring uh, my son onto this because I had just started working with him, apprenticing under him at the time uh, for Alita Battle Angel. And so he said, you want to come on and be my one other crew member so we can do this whole thing together? And while we're making it, let's make an entire documentary about how to make a film with no money. And it yeah. was super, for such a blast of an experience. We quickly brought on Rebel to both star in it so that Obviously. he could be there on set to help us out. Because the only crew members we had were the cast. When they weren't on camera, they were behind camera, moving lights, moving props, closing doors for sounds. Being and a flag, so, just like being, <laughs> being a flag to block light. in front of a light, just like. <laughs> That's brilliant. That That's real, awesome. bare, real, real bare bones uh, film production. And so we cast Rebel and put him in, wrote, I wrote him into almost every scene so that he could always be there to help us. And then uh, Rebel went on to do the score for it as well. And uh, I'll, so that's the premise of Red Eleven. I'll tell you, it was, to this day, it's still my favorite film project we ever did because it's so creative. When you have nothing, all you have is your mind. You have to be creative every single day. Is Everything's falling apart, even when you've limited it so much. Uh, every single day things are falling apart and you have to c come up with creative solutions, laughing at it, laughing about it with your dad and your brother and the cast, who you've quickly become friends with because you're all in the same trench together. It's really, really a sublime experience. And the most, the coolest part about it was, you know, what you see your parents as these figures that have like lived so much life and you don't feel like you could ever be put in the forced in the same situation together and see how each other act. But I thought he would be my my dad would be my mentor on this and that oh he's he knows exactly how to do all this he's paved the way before but it was really humbling and inspiring to 
him look at me and go, I don't know how we're going to do it either. Let's figure it out here. You and I, we're going to sit here. We're going to figure it out. We're going to move this, do that. So to really see him put into the same pressure, put in the same experience, that was mind blowing. And is one of my favorites. He doesn't have all the answers all the time. He finds them. And that's what he's really, really good at. So he knows how to find answers on a dime like that and create some really great stuff out of it. So, I mean, it was just cool to finally see it. It's like, how does he work when he's put into this pressure? It's like, oh, it's just like all of us too, but he's just that much. He's learned that much more about how to do it and stuff. So it's it's a skill people can develop and learn. So yeah, it's it's, so. it's like like I call uh, I call I tell my daughters I have old man strength, uh, and that that's a <laughs> thing by the way. Old man strength is a thing. I had a trainer who was twenty like something I'm lifting. I'm lifting up more than he is. It's like how are you doing that? You're out of shape. I'm like <laughs> I have old man strength now. In the same tone, uh, Robert has not old man strength, but you know he's got experience. He's got a wealth of you know you just pick up these things and you know when yeah. you're on set you've just been there before so yeah. even though i might not know how to do it right now oh yeah this over yeah over yeah. here move that over there yeah. uh it's it's pretty yeah. remarkable uh, yeah. it's pretty yeah. remarkable to see it's cool how it fundamentally starts you all start out in the same spot we don't know how we're going to do it and then it's just like that's what you're developing is the learning of how you're going to do it so it's did really you cool did you guys just run and gun i mean you had some plan obviously you had a script but yeah. did you kind of show up on the day and just go, all right, let's set up the scene or did where there's a lot of storyboards, oh. things like that? No, Oh man, it was pretty run and gun because it's funny. The one, uh, we, we kind of restricted it a little, even a little more than mariachi because now we had all the money to make a movie with a budget, but we cut out the money. Now we had all the crew and people we know who could do it, but we cut out the crew and then it's like, well, I guess all we have left is time. 14 days but robert didn't even have that at this point because we were busy uh mate doing visual effects for lead battle angel and writing other projects so we would just we would just pick days that we could get a few hours in and tally it up to 14 uh to 14 really? days and so over the course of a month month and a half we just squeezed in some hours there squeezed in some hours here so that leads to very much you're, you're texting the cast like an hour before you get there hey we're gonna film the day we got like four hours let's go knock out this scene while we can <laughs> so people just show up and like oh gosh we don't know how we're gonna do this well let's figure it out right yeah. now because we've only got uh what time is it all right let's keep going <laughs> we gotta figure so it was a out. side so it's a side hustle it was a side hustle it was, it was, it was, a, side, it was yeah. a side hustle <laughs> film yep yeah side it hustle was crazy filmmaking. um so i mean really run whole... and gun I wasn't on the writing side of it, but whole scenes were rewritten because you get on set and go, well, we don't have this, this, this and that. OK, well, let's just change it up to make it work with this. And it was just like nonstop. Yeah. I mean, it's writing, that... writing it right there as everyone's showing up. So then you can do the scene right away. I mean, it's really yeah. It's, yeah. it's remarkable. And that's such a lesson for filmmakers listening, because so many filmmakers, you know, they think they, they should study like Hitchcock or Scorsese or, you know, Kubrick and. Uh, you know, they like, oh, everything has to be exactly the way I have it in my mind because I'm a genius and, you know, we're all geniuses. Uh -huh. I mean, all of us obviously are geniuses, filmmaking <laughs> geniuses. Uh, and soon Hollywood <laughs> will see our genius. And that's how we right. think because we're all nuts. We're all absolutely <laughs> insane, the filmmaker. We're all insane. Ab absolutely. Yeah. So I, I've seen on set where I visited other, other filmmaker sets that they just break down if something's not exactly the way they planned it. And, and that's, and I'm like, that guy's not going to make it. He, he, because filmmaking isn't that filmmaking is even yeah. even the biggest guys who have had an opportunity to talk to many of them some of the fam most famous scenes in the history i've talked to these i've talked to some of these filmmakers and they're just like yeah it, it, it's, it's on the day <laughs> <laughs> for yeah. sure Absolutely. Or, uh, everything's planned out half of it falls apart which is pretty much how it goes you plan it all so that way as much of what was planned will stay there as possible the rest is going to fall apart and you got to figure it out from there but <laughs> it's yeah absolutely it's, you kind of accept it and you got to learn to roll with the punches as much as you do figure things out ahead of time so and yeah. and racer when you started writing rebel 11 with uh with your dad you guys kind of I think the first time I'd ever heard, I'm sure it happened somewhere else in, in cinema history, but when Mariachi was written, he was just writing around the things he had already, which was such a revolutionary idea as opposed uh -huh. to like, I need to buy, I need to have a Porsche in this scene. I need to like, do you have a Porsche? No, it's going to cost you for what you have a Volkswagen. Just use the Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So he wrote around the elements, literally like a dog, a turtle, and a Mexican town and a couple guns. And that's what I had. And that's how I made my yeah. movie. Can you explain the power of that in the Red 11 experience of just writing around things that you know you have access to? Because it does free you a lot and, and lessens the stress a bit on a stressful situation already. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we wanted to implement the exact same writing process for Red 11. And so we said, let's only take what we got and go from there. So we filmed the entire uh, film, uh, all of it, on our Troublemaker Studios, our studios here in Austin, which is two airport two, uh, airport hangars and then a bunch of hallways and offices. And we thought we will write a story that works for this uh, location and that's all we're going to use. And so location, we just used all that we had. Now, what Robert's got kind of in his back pocket now is, is a little more than a turtle and a bus now. We have the whole storage that, because we're kind of hoarders, we keep all of our props and anything we've ever used in a movie before. Uh, so we have all the guns, all the gadgets, all the things locked up somewhere. So we pulled from there as all our props, but still, we only wrote around what we could get out of that uh, storage room, out of that locker. A lot of people can get more than that from Goodwill nowadays, but um, so or, or out of their dad's closet, really. So mm -hmm. we came at it from the same approach, and it is really freeing because it unlocks creativity in a way you can't imagine. Suddenly, when you have just the one thing you're going to use in a scene and the one room you're going to have to use, you come up with five or six more ideas than you would of just kind of thinking what you would want, uh, going with what you have versus what you want. It's really powerful. I, I anybody I talk to nowadays, I, uh, and they want to make a whole feature film. They've done shorts and whatnot, and they've done it in a traditional setting. I tell them, okay, write a feature and just go off of what you've got. Just trust me, it's powerful. The, it's... the what you want is the rep of doing the entire film from beginning to end. You don't want to have to add more pressure of having to get things to ha land to be there on time or people or places or objects like that's really freeing. And uh, to this pretty much on every project, you'll find yourself using that same method uh, going yeah. forward. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, really what it does is when you're just there thinking about I could make anything. What am I going to make? I mean, there's like a trillion different options. There's an infinite amount of yeah. options, really. And it's just you'll end up with something that's got too many elements, too much this, too much that. By just using what you have, it streamlines it all in an instant. And it's like, you've got three things. Okay, well, now i got to write a whole story about these three things. And it's just, it really does probably one of the most important things is really streamlining what kind of an idea you have. And from there, a lot generates because you go, well, I only have this, this, and that. How do you make a story with this, this, and that? So, yep. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell and, you, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Yeah. The, and the process just gets a little funny on Red 11, part of why it's so special, because you go, OK, this scene only has to have a syringe, this office and the jackhammer that George Clooney used in Dustle Dawn. How are we going to do it? So so it's a little unique in that way. How does way, that but... make sense? It's just, yeah, it goes from there. But... It's like a crazy Mad Libs. It's like a it's crazy like, Mad, Libs. Mad Libs. Mad Lib filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I mean, I got inspired uh, going down the road of Mariachi and Red 11, my last feature. I shot exactly the same way. I said, oh, you know what? Great. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot an entire movie at Sundance while the movie, while the festival's going on uh, wow. and steal the, steal the entire movie, uh, have three actors I had never met before. Meet me there. I had an apartment on main street and a uh, cameraman myself and the sound guy. And we just stole the whole thing in three days and shot an entire wow. movie in three days and we sold it and it made money and <laughs> did it for about That's three amazing. grand. And oh yeah, That's it was crazy. so much fun because I knew That's Sundance awesome. and I'm like, and it's like, it was kind of like the Mexican town because you could get right. a thousand locations in a couple blocks. So I'm right, like, dink, 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 dink. Everyone's yeah. like, how did you, how did you, did you get permission? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I shot in Sundance headquarters. I went into Sundance headquarters and wow, shot. Full. I'm like, amazing. people are in my scene. I'm like, can you move? Please? I'm shooting. Can you please? <laughs> <laughs> that is my amazing. D my oh DP is like, my DP is like, dude, we don't have permission to be. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm the direct, the director in me is like, you're ruining my shot. Can you please move, <laughs> sir? That's so funny. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay, I'm writing down to watch that later. That yeah, is yeah. <laughs> I'll let you guys see it. Don't worry, I'll send it to you. That's it was, it was so great. much. It was it was so much fun to do, but you know, and I've shot other things, and you know, with bigger budgets and stuff, but that was so much fun. It was an experimental, just like, I don't care what happens with this three grand. Let's just go and have some fun. And uh, the actors, I told the actors, I sold the actors. I go, you know, I don't know what's going to, I truly, when I was on the trip back to LA at the time, I didn't know if I had a movie. Did I get enough coverage? I don't know. Because <laughs> you didn't sure. have time to yeah. see dailies. You were just like, 
moving. Go, go, go. Yeah. Go, go, go. So then I told him, like, look, at least you're going to have an insane story to tell somebody in 20 years that the one time you, you went to Sundance, you shot a movie. Like, that's going to make you have to, I'll give you stories because I can't pay you a whole lot. So I'll give you <laughs> stories. And it worked. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> that's incredible. Oh, my God. So, um, that's, so, yeah, that it, is it was the a lot best. Of that is the best extrapolation of El Mariachi filmmaking I've yeah. ever heard. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate like... that. Um, so, oh, all right. Man. So, on Red Eleven, what was the biggest challenge for you guys? You know, just because there's challenges every day, every second Absolutely. of every day. But what was the time that you were just like, "How are we gonna get out of this?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. It felt like there was, <laughs> oh man, it felt like each day had an existential threat like that. Oh man. <laughs> like, oh, we might not be able to finish this project ever. Uh-oh. Really? Uh, it felt like every day had a, something like that. It's weird. I can't really pinpoint one problem, but rather that the very first time that we had our plan, we had our script and we got to set and it was a scene with, gosh, I want to say like 20 actors in it. Uh, and so much had to ride on what we had written, but then none of it could because uh, the set was off and then a part right. of the studio broke down so we couldn't use it. Uh, some of the cast, main cast couldn't be there. And we thought, oh my gosh. And I was just thinking, how the heck are we going to fix this? Uh, again, running into that moment of having to be creative. Uh, the biggest problem was right after uh, my dad tells me, oh, well, we're, guess we're just going to figure it out. Like what ran through my mind beyond that after that, that was definitely the biggest problem. But then realizing that every single problem after that, no matter what it was, whether it was the hangar we were in was not soundproof. So it decided to Texas rainstorm on our f finale scene that includes a lot of dialogue all over that hangar. So none of the dialogues usable, whether it was that or missing cast members or just completely losing an entire vehicle that we had set up. <laughs> um, none of that. Like none of that is bigger or all of that is just an extension of the same problem of we're going to figure it out. We're going to wow. get everybody in a room in a, the quietest room and we're going to re-record all the lines we just did, hoping that they match up to what we just filmed over there in the rainy hangar. So, and it does like magic. So yeah. that's so it's funny that that is what I would say is the biggest problem is the recurring one that you <laughs> learn to go with the flow with. And by the end of the production, you laugh the most at those and you're like, those were the most fun, really, when we were all put in the same corner. And had to punch our way out. That those are the most fun. Those are the that's, stories, as you said. Those become the stories. It's like, <laughs> you don't forget that stuff. And it, that's remar that's yeah. remarkable. I mean, and one thing I, I noticed about Red Eleven is that you guys used a lot of practical effects because uh, you just didn't have the budget to do anything else, really. <laughs> so, can you talk a little bit about the power of practical effects? Just just the phone, the telekinetic phone <laughs> on the on the little on that little table. Which is such an easy practice. I mean, it when because I saw the behind the scenes. By the way, everyone listening have to watch Rebel Without a Crew, uh, the show, but also the behind the scenes of Red Eleven because it is a film school and then some. Um, but the the phone moving with the mag, I'm like, it's so when you when you show it to you, it's super simple. But <laughs> if not, you're, you're like using wires or stuff. It was such yeah. a beautiful way. Can you talk about the power of practical effects, where so many filmmakers just want to lean on computer effects? Oh, where absolutely. practical effects, I mean, look at Nolan. He's doing okay. You know, he's doing okay with the practical effects. Yeah. You know? so. uh, absolutely. Yeah, the, that, the Red 11 was really, I've, coming right off of Alita Battle Angel, which right. was the most visual effects we've ever used. We didn't have entire characters that didn't exist until we put them in digitally mm -hmm. later. Uh, coming off of that, it was a shell shock. We got the bends definitely on Red 11, but it's so much more fun and so much more immediately gratifying on camera when you get a practical effect working and you see it and you go oh my gosh i can't believe we're getting away with this look how look how dumb this looks when you look two feet this way but in the lens it looks incredible look at that i'm totally fooled practical effects i've really come to appreciate and go that's the magic most timeless aspects of uh of filmmaking you know when we when we see the the predator and we see oh my gosh look how much that suit and that face and that creature still holds up to this day where it still feels just as real just as like slimy and tactile as it did when it released in what 84 87 whatever it was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um 
like that to, to me practical effects are the most timeless aspects of film and i want to incorporate a lot more into live action filmmaking and see a lot more of it because it's as i say that's the real movie magic right there yeah but uh the most imp- i was add that the most important thing of a practical effects is that you can write is that you can make it mean a lot more than what it is the simple two dollar trick it is because you can write a story around it you can uh right. make it meaningful right. through the story you can bring it back multiple times you can uh make the same trick mean something and just then thus stick with the audience so that's really what i see the power of practical effects how about you yeah again Google. if you work with what you have that phone trick is actually a very important story moment. It's like that's literally dragging a phone on a string or with a magnet is an important story thing. And it's like that's how you have to approach writing and approach creating as well, because you just get you get a lot more mileage out of what little you have. And it's really, really cool. Well, I mean, I when I um, when I saw I think it was Once Upon a Time in Mexico was the introduction of the guacamole gun for me. I remember the guacamole gun for the first time. <laughs> if you guys have not heard about the guacamole gun, I have an entire tutorial on it on YouTube of how I built my guacamole gun oh, nice. <laughs> um, back in the day because my friend and I were making our first short film and we're like, we need to blow this girl's head off. Like, how are we going to blow this girl's head off? And we built a, we, we just cobbled together air, air, what is it, air compressor gun yeah, and, uh-huh, yeah. and the PVC pipe. We did multiple, like, ex- at first it was like someone was peeing on you. It was not enough pressure. <laughs> and then, like, we got to put like, what's brain matter. And like, it was so much fun, but that that's a practical, we use a ton of practical effects on my, one of those first uh, films I made because it was cheap and we had a lot of visual effects too, but the practical effects sell so yeah. much easier and it's done. No rendering. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> no crashes, no nothing. But if uh-huh. uh, the guacamole gun, man, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the way that's it looks. Hilarious. Yeah. The way it looks when you film it is how it's going to look in the final movie. It's like, it yeah. just you got it. You got it. There's no, well, and, let's hope we have enough money to make it look good. It's like, well, if it looks great here, you're going to be fine, honestly. So, and, I, and I'm a big proponent of combining practical and visual. Because Absolutely. if you have a base of practical, like in that that headshot that we did in that movie, I had my VFX guy just throw a couple more splatters out off of yeah. it. But if it would have been just the the VFX, it, you wouldn't have sold it. It's just oh. we didn't have the technology in I think 2004 <laughs> oh, at wow. the time yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. to really make blood hits that really uh-huh. sung. So Absolutely. adding those little things or fire, if you do fire, like yep. fire still yeah. is rough. Visual effects it's still rough. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. still difficult. It, it's it's hard to fake fake out the human eye. Uh, well, I mean, if you remember um, the Rock, remember the movie The Rock? Yeah, uh-huh, that, uh-huh. that there was an explosion of the 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 the, the car, not the car, the yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. table car that blows up. You can see the visual effect flame that they kind of wrapped around it as it blew up, yeah. while the bottom was all real. And I'm yeah. like, man, God, uh, <laughs> that's only trained it, eyes could see that. Only, yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. only yeah. a cinephiles sure. will notice that for stuff. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. But it has a subtle effect too, even to people who don't catch it. It's a subconscious effect of like this isn't entirely real, and it <laughs> loses gravity as a result. So. Oh no, my wife, I mean, because she was not in the film industry whatsoever. And when she's, st- you know, been together for nearly 20 years, now we'll watch a movie. She's like, that green screen composite was really bad. And I'm like, <laughs> sure. really? And she's like, yeah, just the compositing wasn't really good. I mean, didn't they have this is a Marvel movie? Didn't they have the money <laughs> to clean that up a little bit? I'm like, wow, wow. It's <laughs> audiences been a long are road. Savvy now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, yeah, audiences. Is- uh, well, but there's I've so many kids. behind I've the heard scenes. So many kids. <laughs> really, kids are like kids go. Stuff? CG was bad. <laughs> like, I didn't like it. Bad CG. But, wow, that's something. <laughs> because yeah. now, as opposed to when Mariachi came out, there was no information. There was just no information. Trust me, I looked. Other than the Raiders of the Lost Ark stunt spectacular VHS behind right. the scenes of or some <laughs> behind the scenes of Star Wars, there really wasn't a lot of behind the scenes. So it was still kind of a mystery, and that's mm-hmm. when all these DVDs that Robert put out with really practical, you know, stuff was you started, that was the beginning, I think of that kind of behind the scenes access. And then now when YouTube showed up and the YouTube's now everybody, you know, could do anything, but back then for people that listen, who don't understand who are of a certain age, they don't, they don't understand how difficult it was back then to, to even begin to do what, what they did on mariachi or or desperado or from dust till dawn or any of the films that he did during that era um but it was a (laughs) 
Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, bad yeah. CG. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I forget to think about that point, but yeah, infra- it was almost CG and all that was movie magic back then because nobody knew how it worked. But now there was a there was a show called kids. Movie Magic. There was a show called <laughs> Movie Magic, and you would watch. It was a thirty minute like behind the scenes of Terminator Two, wow. you know wow. those kind of things, and you were just like, "That's great." I don't have James Cameron money, so <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's nice. But that's why when when you know Desperado and and from Dustal Dawn's documentary and behind the scenes of Mariachi, it was the first time you're like, I, I think I could build a guacamole gun. I think yeah. I think uh-huh. I can I can do that. So it was this inspirational uh, way of looking at filmmaking. It's yeah, remarkable. Sure. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so with with Red Eleven, um, Rebel, what was it like composing? Um, with it, I mean, because again, that's another thing that your dad did. He's like, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna start writing music for the hell of it. And, and, and like, <laughs> yeah. and I remember that. I'm like, wow, what, dude? Calm down, <laughs> yeah. Robert. Calm the hell down. What's wrong? Come on, <laughs> steady cam, craft service. I mean, stunts. Like, come on, dude. Yeah. No. So, go, so <laughs> you, you would just be like, yeah, you know, I think I want to try that. Yeah, I, I want the music to be like this. I'll just do it. And it's like, wow, okay. I mean, you, it's. You forget how revolutionary that is. Like the, the, right, no director who which director no. was writing and editing? Then which director was writing, editing, and doing music, and then also doing cinematography, and then I mean, it, all that stuff. It's really Carp- Carpenter's the only one that I know of that did music for his own movies, but he uh, still didn't do everything else. Yeah, you know? that's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's it's really special. But uh there's a thing, he always that's always been the way he's like wanted to teach us is if okay, if you want to get into movies and stuff. I'm just going to throw you in onto something you don't know how to do all entirely. And you're going to learn while you're doing it pretty much. So racer was his only other crewmate. He had to do all the sound. He had never done sound before. And so I, never, I know the feeling brother. I know yeah. the feeling. My first <laughs> I did the sound, even though I could afford it. I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do it. Myself. Gonna do it. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm never doing sound again. <laughs> again. <laughs> I'm sure you learn For real sure. quick though. In like what a good dealer. what a good yeah. sound what a good sound guy is and why he's valuable or she's valuable on set <laughs> yeah because my next film yeah. my next film I had a sound I'm like oh god everything sounds yeah. so good thank you thank you <laughs> yeah I know it's getting a budget next time absolutely <laughs> oh my god For that's sure. crazy that's yeah, crazy so it was uh I mean I was writing a little bit of music at home I was always been playing piano since I was a kid and I stopped high school stopped taking piano lessons and I was like I want to do something with music and somehow. All those years that never quite dawned on me. Oh, right. My dad makes movies. I could write music for movies, right? They have stories and you can write some music. I mean, like, it took me that long, by the way. But I was like, you know, that would be cool. So it, I'd been writing a little bit on throughout the year before. And I wrote like 15 minutes of music for a VR short um, Robert and Racer did called The Limit. That was like my mm-hmm. first scoring project. And then from there, he was like, well, now you just write a whole feature, you know, you just just a little extra you just got to write longer more stuff and i was like okay and i was on my laptop on logic just logic yes making stuff yeah nice. it was like nice. after writing after writing on garage band for most of the time i mean i started just like with nothing and just, just like <laughs> with a little keyboard and i was like all right well we got to figure this out and it was probably one of the most stressful experiences ever but it was really really fun and special to start looking at the movie and go Right. I guess this is when you would do a character theme and stuff like here. You can play a theme for a character and build that up across and you start getting understanding. Even if your tools are really small, you start learning the thinking and the methodology behind it a little bit more. So and appreciate That's... like when something times up well and all that. So I it taught me a sense of pacing. At least I kind of learned when I wrote a scene, I was like, that didn't pace that that wasn't paced well to the scene. It felt weird. <laughs> and then when it actually <laughs> did work or not, but. Can, yep. can yeah. we just say, can we say something publicly here that your father's insane? Let's just throw that out there. I mean, <laughs> as a general Absolutely. statement, he, he, the insanity of trying to make mariachi, it's insane at a time yeah. that nobody was made. And that insanity has kept going throughout his career. He's been insane <laughs> in the most beautiful, wonderful way. Insane Absolutely. to like, hey, Rebel, you've never done it. Come over here. Yeah. <laughs> Figure it out. Like that's pretty insane. much on, a, a, you know, on like, you know, small budget films first, but then, you know, then you're like thrown into the deep end of the water yeah. with some bigger budget stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, <laughs> he's like you, you want to learn. You. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, you want to <laughs> learn how to swim? I'm going to throw you out into the ocean. And once you're like coughing up along the water, I'll fish you back out. That's how you're going to learn. It's like, you that's right. Shark boy. Fire. shark boy, get out there. Shark boy. <laughs> yeah. You're going to do your own stunts. Get out there. I mean, it's, yeah, it's pretty much always been that. And when uh, sharks swim. 
Yeah, that's exactly. what starts with exactly. But it's yeah. but we all have to. But we all have to be kind of insane to even be in this business. This is an insane. Oh, we're like this is carny. We're all carnies, and this is the circus. <laughs> I mean, at a carnival, we're all carnies. We all smell of yeah. cabbage uh, and have small hands. Um, not joking. <laughs> yeah, but uh, absolutely, but it's true. It's true. Yeah, Go ahead, it's true. It's true. And uh, right. what I think one of the most important lessons it's taught us every time it's half you've had to do it where you're like i have no clue what i'm doing you know you just feel like and in right. this one even though the budget was small i had seen all the work we had done and i was like i'm gonna score all that work and if it sucks i like you know drop the ball right after everyone else put in all this effort so it is a lot but um the most important thing it taught me is you're really not ever going to be ready it's like you have to you're not always, you're never going to be fully comfortable. I can do this and then dive into it. You're always going to have that. I don't know if I can do this. I, I'm almost there, but I don't know. That's when you got to start is you'll become ready as you're doing it. And you learn a lot more actually doing it. You know, when you actually have to, when the boat has to actually hold water, you'll learn a lot more of what actually works, what doesn't work. So you do have to be right, you know, put yourself out there and actually be willing to fail sometimes, you know? Don't write, don't make your first movie feature when you, you know, you can do it. It's like, you're not going to feel like, you know, you're ready at all. You know, maybe you've done some shorts, maybe you've done some of this. You just got to dive in there and do it basically. So w would you agree that the, one of the biggest, the biggest skill sets, any filmmaker at any level, any crew person, anything is the ability to understand and accept failure as far as part of the process and not to like that, let that derail you. You just have to kind of keep going. Cause that is a skill set that most people don't have, let alone filmmakers yeah. don't have yes, that yeah. ability to fail. Um, and it seems like, you know, what your, your father and your mother have taught you throughout your career is failure is okay. You know, Hey, yeah, everyone yeah. has, everyone goes yeah. up and down and exactly. sometimes you have yeah. a good movie. Sometimes you have, eh, I like uh -huh. the movie, but the audience didn't like the movie. Didn't do well <laughs> in the box office. Didn't do this or that. Exactly. Or, Oh my God, how the hell did that happen? Like <laughs> there's all of it, all yeah. of it, but, but failures is a big deal. Can you can talk a little bit about that from your experience? Yes. Yeah, no, that is totally it. I mean, he says you learn so much more from your failures than your successes. And I mean, he's shown it all throughout his career, you know, four rooms, was didn't do all that great but right what he saw was hey it's actually pretty funny to have these two little kids here who like get into all this trouble they barely even tie their own sh their shoes and they're like doing all this stuff how about like they're spies or something that's where that came from so you know from his failure came spy kids which ended up being a humongous thing so he's always been excited to just jump in and trip and fail because he knows you'll you know when you stumble when you go down that path that no one's ever gone where you ha you're not comfortable with you'll stumble but you also stumble upon new things you'll stumble upon great new ideas for stuff and yeah it's i don't think you're ever going to fully appreciate that you have more to learn unless you've seen you have things to work on basically so it's almost like you're guaranteed it's not like i it was a it's not like it was a home run making the Red 11 score. I had things that I was like, that really didn't work out. This wasn't that. But instantly from there, I was like, that's what I need to get better at. That's what's, you know, this is really important. I never would have probably realized that unless I actually scored a movie and seen this works, this doesn't work, that, all that. So it's really, um, yeah, it teaches you to accept failure pretty quick. <laughs> so, how about you? How about you I, I absolutely, yeah, absolutely agree. It's one of the most important skill sets that anyone can have. And I can point a lot to what makes you averse to failure because uh, we felt it, you know, whether you're the son of anybody important or whether you're just comparing yourself to somebody that you're not like any of the other great filmmakers because we watch all these great movies and you want to be like them. But the most important, you're, and you're going to see only your failures and you're not going to look at any of theirs. Um, right. and you're going to, yeah, <laughs> right. or what, or what you, what they consider their failure, you consider their greatest work. So, you know, you're blind to other people's failures and, you know, you can compare yourself to like, ah, oh, man, I'm the age he made the mariachi and he did all that by himself. And like, I haven't done anything. Uh -huh. I haven't made a film all by myself like that too. And it's like, this is, and his made such a big splash, but like, I haven't made anything like that, but you know, comparing to others makes you so averse to failure because that's one of the biggest drivers drivers of why you don't want to fail. But you just got to fail. You just got to go at it and fail and compare yourself only with yourself, really. So as Rebel just said, you know, OK, wasn't a score wasn't a slam dunk, but I know where I can do better next time. So right. I'm going to try it. I know I'm going to make that better for myself and for the audience next time. That's what I want to do.
So, you know, it's, and, and when you're saying that, the first thing that came into my mind is as filmmakers of, of my generation, first thing you think of is when you hit 23, you go, Orson Welles made Citizen Kane at 23. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I haven't done crap. And you're like, but it's okay. It's okay. And then it hit 27. You're like, Spielberg made Jaws at 27. Oh God. So then you keep moving. It's like, I want to Quentin, Quentin make Reservoir like at what, 30 or something like that. Yeah. And, and you keep pushing, you keep pushing. Uh, Terminator, like, 30. Something. Like, and then now oh, you're man. like, Ridley Scott didn't make his first film till 40. Like, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. you just keep trying to make yeah. yourself feel better. You're like, oh, yeah. uh, at a certain, by the way, that's when I made my first feature at 40. <laughs> <laughs> I, wow. I couldn't i i, I got wow. I, that's a whole other story of why i didn't do it before but i did a lot of other directing and other things like that mm -hmm. but you start going you're like oh, okay but if you do compare yourself to these quote-unquote gods and that's another thing that a lot of filmmakers do they put these filmmakers up on pedestals i mean look i have a, a stanley kubrick behind, <laughs> uh, autograph book behind me then i got hitchcock right next to it you know i mean wow. all the, i have i have books from all my favorite filmmakers behind me huh. it, you know you do put them up on a pedestal but one of the great honors and privileges of my life of doing this show is i get to talk to some of these sometimes these guys mm -hmm. these yeah. gods and then i start to realize i realized a long time ago when I did the first shows, I was like, they all have the same issues. They all have, they don't have enough money. They don't have enough time. They, they all, I always tell people, you're going to, no matter who you are in this business, you're going to get punched in the face. At every <laughs> Spielberg still gets punched in the face. Not as much as he used to, you know, Robert, I'm sure still gets punched in the face, sideswiped like, oh, I didn't see that coming. You know, yeah, from absolutely. the business or something like that. The difference is that now, as you get older, you start to learn how to duck a little bit. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it just grazes you, and sometimes you're not even there when the punch is thrown because you've been around a little bit longer. But no, but no matter who you are, you're gonna go through. The, it is the great equalizer filmmaking. Mm -hmm. No matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, you could have. Look at Cameron. Jesus, look at look what James is doing. You know, I mean, he has all uh, yeah. the money in the world. To me. He's oh. the only filmmaker who does that, by the way. It's, people, <laughs> people are like, "Who do you think could have made Avatar?" Only James Cameron. No, only James Cameron. Absolutely, they're not giving. They're not giving that to Spielberg, to Nolan, to Fincher, to to Robert, to no no one else is getting half a billion dollars to like. I might make a movie in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, it's just, it's insane, yeah, yeah. right? It's yeah, yeah. it's insane. <laughs> but it but no matter how much money you have, there's every day there's a problem because it's mm -hmm. part of the, the artistic process so um so you you brought up four rooms by the way my favorite four rooms obviously is roberts because it was the most fun uh, and that uh -huh. was the, that was the moment that you started to see the shift into the family stuff because before mm -hmm. then it was stuff that you guys could watch yeah. um and then <laughs> spy uh -huh. kids came out and i want to impress on people what spy kids means to so many people around the mm -hmm. world spy kids is one of those franchises in the first film there had never been anything like that again, Robert. Nothing had ever been <laughs> made like that with Latino, Latino uh, people. I always said this because I'm Latino. Um, I'm of Cuban descent, and I'd never seen myself portrayed in a movie like that before. But anytime I do, it was always like, "Hi, I'm Latino. Let me eat my taco," and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and like it was sure. so on the nose, right. where it was never mentioned in Spy Kids. It was just no. they're just people having an adventure. And I think that was another one of those points that inspired other filmmakers to bring in other cultures and not point out like, there's the black guy, there's the Asian yeah. guy. There's a, mm -hmm. It's like, no, let's just, it's a story. And it opened up as Spy Kids was one of the first times I saw that in the Latino culture. And, you know, when I, when my kids were old enough, I showed them Spy Kids and they just like gobbled up the first four. <laughs> like oh, they were just man, like, oh great. my God. Because it's like that's great. Aww. Kids will always watch a movie or a story that gives kids power. Mm -hmm. It that's it's a give. Anytime there's kids in power, making adults look like idiots, done. It's a hit. <laughs> it's a hit. Am I wrong? Am I right? <laughs> You're yeah. very right. The motto of Spike <laughs> is make kids feel powerful, make kids feel cool. That's right. Funny. Exactly. And then we that's are the heroes. Motto. And then you did yeah. that with uh, we are heroes as well. Yep. So, yeah. What was your experience when you guys first saw Spy Kids? And because you were on it, you were shooting. Uh, tell me what your experience was making it. 
Because I know you were. How old were you guys when Spy Kids? Came? <laughs> so it's I was vague for me, but yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, your level was two when it first came out. So I was okay. I was four when the first one came out, and that was imagine you you're from like zero to four years old you don't you kind of know that your parents do something they do work this thing called job they've got one but you don't know what it is you see dad go off to this office that's attached to the house and he goes he goes off and he disappears all day and he's doing something and no matter how many times he comes home to tell you that he's making a movie you don't you don't like get it you don't really understand until you're sitting in a you're sitting in a car service riding to this movie theater where now there's instead of a quiet tuesday afternoon there's thousands of kids and families gathered outside of this theater and you're like oh there's a there's a carpet there's like wait where why are we walking down this why are we dressed so nice to go to this movie theater and then you sit in the theater you watch this mind-blowing movie called spike it's one and end credits come on and both your mom and dad's names come out at the end and you're like what Okay, wait. And like, wait, all these other crew people who I've met and I know their names too. This is crazy. Wait, you all make movies? <laughs> you made this? Yeah. That's it, it <laughs> my on dad you. and mom? Yeah. Yeah. People who it, like raising me? What? Yeah. yeah. It <laughs> really did last night. <laughs> yeah, he made exactly. me pancakes yesterday morning. Like, what? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it really takes him showing you the props afterwards and going, look, here he is. Here's the jet pack. Here's the buddy pack. Here's the thumb thumb. We made these. They're on the movie. It's like it takes that much for you to finally go. Oh, OK, I get it. Yeah, it's just like, yeah. So, oh, my kids, uh, my kids st still don't understand what I do. They're like, you're <laughs> on sure. like you're on YouTube, but you also make movies. And uh, can we watch your movies? No, you're not old enough for the movies I made. Yeah, yet. Yeah. They're like, OK, so but you're on YouTube. Do you have well, followers? People follow you. People you have subscribers. <laughs> You, yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then I got, no, I got recognized a couple times in public, which is oh crazy, gosh. crazy yeah. uh -huh. with them. And they're just like, what, what, why? <laughs> like, and then it's the thumb. It's like showing you the jetpack, and like somebody else's. Right. It's, it's, it's remarkable. The, <laughs> the, 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 veil, the realization, the, the veil yeah. that we have as, as kids to what our parents did. Yeah. And and you just like and you need to be hit over the head for you to go. Oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah. they make movies. Oh, because he'd say he movies, and here we are making home movies, and we're like, well, he just kind of like we're just everyone makes breakfast. home movies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so that's what you thought. You're like, oh, we're yeah. making, of course, yeah. everyone makes movies. Like yeah. oh, <laughs> hit yeah. over the head with it for sure. That's a good yeah. word. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it's and you know for you, when you see it like that. And then amazing. you're a part of the next, all the next ones, you know, it makes a lasting impact on you too. You know, we joke that our family is the biggest fans, the biggest geeks of Spy Kids ever. Yeah. <laughs> we geek out the most over all the props and vehicles and actors and anything. That's amazing. <laughs> but, but yeah. So it's, it's not just the impact that on us. It's like not a stretch at all to see how much it's impacted people, you know, across the world and how much they remember uh -huh. it and love it and have so, such fond memories of it. So. And, and and for people listening, when Spy Kids One came out, it it was a massive hit. Like it was, it was a massive hit. Like the, <laughs> the biggest hit your parents ever had. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. it was. And <laughs> McDonald Toys. I remember. Yeah, McDonald <laughs> Toys. It was a it was a a, a, a a thing with McDonald's. That I was like, yep. this was huge. It was. It was. Huge. It, was <laughs> it was huge. And like. Yeah. Hey, maybe we should do some more of this kid stuff. <laughs> yeah. This kid there stuff is, is pretty cool. In the kitchen, there is still a little Ralph. I there's a little Ralph toy about this big, just sitting up on one of the ledges, and he really? fell one day. And I got a picture of him. I was like, man, it took that long for him to finally fall down. I got a picture of him. I put him right back up there. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> back on your pedestal, I, King. And I was a kid just staring at him up there, like, when can I play with him? <laughs> He's just, they knew we'd lose him as a kid, but so he just stayed up there. It's like, no, no, he's spying. He's just <laughs> he's spying. But it's he's crazy spying. how pervasive it was everywhere. I mean, it just, and it was just so, yeah. so impactful too. So yeah. And, and again, you know, like the you one said, that, nothing like that. I mean, it's just. No, nothing like that. And you know, what was really fascinating to me too, is that with spy kids, uh, your parents didn't fall into the same trap that so many Hollywood filmmakers get into was when they have a big hit. The studios show up and like, here's more money. Take a lot more money and yeah, just double the, the budget and just do whatever you want. And they said, no, we're going to do the exact same budget. 
and it'll be fine. And it's and that's such a smart move. It's such a brilliant move because yeah. you get intoxicated with money being thrown the at success you. And the, yeah. the success. And they said, no, 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 we're good. Give us the same. We'll make another one. And yeah. it was so brilliant because if that's not as big of a hit, it's okay. But if they mm-hmm. would have taken a hundred thousand, hundred, they could have easily got a hundred million dollar budget for the next one, absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. comfortably, and it would not have been a good business move. So it, that's another lesson, you know, for all of us who will eventually have the Spy Kids kind of uh, fame and, <laughs> and success. Remember, don't take the yeah. hundred million when they offer it to you, boys. Right. Girls listening. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but you it know, is, but I, it that's is. a really good observation. I'd never thought of uh I'd never thought about that not once till you mentioned it today, but I Oh god. Complete, it, I really agree with you. Yeah, that's I mean, I'm just another side of their <laughs> genius, you know, the, how well, smart they were and how thoughtful about filmmaking and how much they can make, how much what right. they can accomplish. Yeah. And it's and it is a lesson that can be a pro, you know, we were joking about the 100 million dollars, but those <laughs> but when that you do have, anywhere. If you have some success anywhere, don't get intoxicated by it. Understand mm-hmm. that this is a moment. It will pass. And you can be right down at the bottom again real quick. Real <laughs> quick. How many filmmakers, how many wonderful filmmakers have we seen who rose, 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 got a little too intoxicated, went a little crazy, bombed, and they get thrown into director jail. And you don't yeah. see them again. And sometimes you don't see them again ever again. And it's such a shame yeah. mm-hmm. where... It, you know, that happens. And again, it happens in any of your successes in any field, anywhere you go. Don't get intoxicated by it because the one thing that people, and that's the one thing I think your parents never really fell into was the, you're the greatest. Oh my God, you're this, you're that. Uh, here's more money. Here's it. The, they just really grounded, really, yeah. really grounded the entire, the entire time they've been making movies. It has been, you could see it in the, in, in the filmography. You know, Sin City, huge, monumental yeah. filmmakers f- that are legendary were like, "How did yeah. you do this?" You know, and yet, cool, cool, <laughs> very, very <laughs> he- level-headed throughout the rest of you know moving forward. It's 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 pretty admirable to see um, yeah. film a filmmaker and and uh, like your parents, both of the filmmakers, stay grounded during this whole process mm-hmm. and then keeping you guys grounded i mean you guys are an example of this groundness because you guys could have e- i mean I've, I've i've met some hollywood quote-unquote hollywood kids uh and <laughs> it's 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 i'm sure you have too uh, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. and it, it, it it's it's a it's a it's a brutal business guys it's a mm-hmm. brutal business can, no. that could eat up somebody and tear them apart and destroy them like that would you agree I completely agree. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. I've always appreciated that groundedness they apply, you know, to their careers that they applied to raising us and in even raising us in the same industry and bringing and now teaching us and training us in the same industry. So yeah, I absolutely agree. That's uh that's a really cool observation. Thank you for that about them. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So now there's this fifth and stuff because you guys can't stop making Spy Kids. I mean, so <laughs> you just, can't stop. <laughs> I mean, it's just like just, just, just back to the horse we go. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I was really we, excited. We, we had other people tell us these are like Bond movies. Like this is such right, a universal this, tale. This just go keep bringing it back forever. every once in a while. <laughs> and just new cast. We'll bring Daniel Craig in. We'll bring yeah, Pierce exactly. Brosnan in. It'll be great. It'll be great. No, these yeah, these could arguably keep. I mean, you guys can. Be, you know, you know, when when Robert and Elizabeth are both, you know, completely retired from making stuff, you guys are like, we're going to keep going. And you could be the Pacholis, like in Spike It. They yeah. just keep going. <laughs> oh, the Broccoli family, the Broccoli family. The, the that, broccoli, yep, yep. That, that just keeps going. And we have to we have to bring in some new Spy Kids. Um, it could easily keep going. I mean, is it, by the way, is Spy Kids Armageddon the beginning of a new trilogy? That you guys are trying yes, to make? That is that's the that's the idea is we we got new kids that we really love new family new parents that we really love and we just love seeing them together and their energy and the first thing everybody sees when they like any of the crew or the producers anybody got to see them on set they're like oh my gosh i want to see so much more they have so much fun so much energy so that was the idea we we just made it a little standalone reboot on its own that was it's kind of the vision going in but seeing it on camera you go oh my gosh i want to keep watching this i want to see more so just like with spike it's one everybody want to see those kids some more 
Right. And now they're like my age, those kids. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> having kids of their own. Yeah. <laughs> having kids of their own and, and all that, you know. And, uh-huh. and then you see one of them in Machete and you're like, wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, all, right. all right. Yeah, right. There you go. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's fascinating. But so, all right, so talk to a little bit about Spy Kids Armageddon. Uh, I know there was, I know Netflix finally got the rights to help you you know, make the sequels and they love what you guys did with, I think we are heroes, right? We are heroes. We are champions. Uh, uh, we can be heroes. Yeah. We can be heroes. Yeah. We can be heroes, yeah. which by the way, loved as well. Such a beautiful uh, story, beautiful film. Uh, My kids you. like watched it a ton of times, you oh, know, it's, it's great. It's, yeah. And the little behind the scenes that they made with you guys, uh, uh-huh. On YouTube and stuff like that it was so much fun to watch what you guys were doing. And then my <laughs> kids were like, "I want a pen and an iPad." I'm like, "Oh Jesus Christ!" <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> great, great, thanks, oh, no. thanks, guys, thanks, Elizabeth, <laughs> thanks, Robert. And Robert, thanks, Robert, and Elizabeth. I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> so tell me a little bit how how this this story came about. How you guys came at this new this new installment? Yeah, it's it's perfect that you mentioned we can be heroes because we had just just finished making that and uh we loved it we had such a great time getting to do a kids a kids film again and uh getting to write that was fun getting to make it was fun and so uh, robert and i were just joking around like oh could you imagine what if we do another spy kids that could be really fun right yeah let's do something like that and uh robert does what he does best we he starts talking to people about it immediately and it was a uh, sky dance that was really interested and it, they said, we would love to do Spy Kids. And Robert and I were laughing from the studio that brings you Mission Impossible comes Spy Kids. Spy Kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it was super, we, we laughed at the idea. And we did a writing process that we've been doing since I was seven. And we did Shark Boy and Lover Girl together is we jump in the pool and have a little notepad next to the pool and just swim around and talk ideas, laugh about things, make jokes, talk about it. And pretty much in that uh, in that pool session, we came with a lot of the major ideas of the story of the film, including the idea that then that uh, in that making of or, or in the behind the scenes with We Can Be Heroes, we mentioned the idea of give kids technology, like don't hold them back to what uh, whatever you did when you were going up or growing up or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Give them the best so that they can go further than you, and they will go up leaps and bounds. So try not to hold them to any restrictions you had. Uh, see what's available now, see what can help them and give that to them. So we loved that. And we were just, we were just talking about it in the making of, and we thought, yeah, what if we made the whole story about that with Spy Kids and Rebel worded it greatly. Go for it, Rebel. The, the idea oh, that I- you worded it greatly, the idea that uh, giving kids technology and how, how that was a huge part of this one. Oh yeah. 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 It was interesting. It kind of all came together because we loved this, you know, it's, Technology's kind of gone a bad rap to some extent, you know, of like, it's all bad. Books are better. And so we were like, how about we have a movie where it's the opposite and the book, the book can be just as bad as the technology can be just as good and vice versa. You know, it's less about the tool and more about the teaching. What are they learning? You know, what are you learning? What values are you kind of uh, learning from that? But that kind of came together with an idea of like, you know, it'd be really cool to have a, uh, to do a Spy Kids where is there any way we could make the whole world change to where suddenly kids have like a unique advantage over adults in some way? Like just Mm. conceptually, is there any way to do that? And we're like, you know, what if like the only way to access technology in the world was through like video games since kids have gotten so adept at this and technology in general that they completely outpace their parents and stuff and that their own things. It's like, if the whole world flipped and if that's like the inciting event, now suddenly the kids are super spies and everyone else is struggling. So it's like now they're really like the only people that can like save the world. That's so that's awesome. So that was like where the concept really started. But yeah. yeah. So kind of the core idea came for that. Yeah. Let's have a bad guy who's a, a villain who's a video game designer and he infects the whole world with a video game virus. And the parent, nobody can get to their devices except the kids can because they're smart and they're savvy with technology and games. So they go leaps ahead of the parents and uh within the course of a few days become super spies and are now having to go save the world and take on all the responsibility of that and so a lot of the core ideas really came to that writing session and yeah from there took off we just started writing creating it uh over the course of 2020 2021 and yeah that was the birth of the new one spike is armageddon i i feel that it's gonna do well sir 
<laughs> I, feel, I feel that the kids are gonna really like my girls are like excited to see it oh um, that's great it, it's yeah it's it, it's it's so admirable to see how you guys have continued that that franchise and mm-hmm. i hope because you know even when i saw the, the trailer i haven't seen the movie yet because we haven't had, had access to it yet but soon soon we're seeing uh-huh. hopefully next week yep. um uh-huh. but um but even the trailer kind of i w- that's why i asked is this a trilogy like i saw it I saw where this was going. I was like, oh, this is not, they're making another trilogy out of this. This is <laughs> solid, solid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's That's... really special. That was kind of the intention of like, you know, you know, I, I get the feeling of like Spy Kids 5, you know, usually when something gets to the fifth, it's like, ah, I don't know what's going on anymore, but we really were like we really only wanted to do it if there was really a story we could tell that's different from the old ones but has the same values and stuff so that's where we kind of saw the opportunity of like right there's almost a modern take on this now that it's been 20 years since the first one where now we have a very significant gap between what that one was about and what this one's about but they're both still about family and they're both still about empowerment of kids and this generation would really love that sort of thing you know and this new form factor and it's really cool now especially that we learned from we can be heroes is uh streaming services is really great for kids they can watch the movie as much as they want not as much as they can convince their parents to go to the movie and drive them there (laughs) so (laughs) they get to watch it that much more so we can be heroes is really impactful and beloved because kids could just watch it at the pace they like watching things you watch it all the way through Gets to the end credits, you just replay it and you do it again, and you do that a few times a day. <laughs> well, you guys might be you guys might be a little young to remember this, but that's exactly what they did in the video store days with Disney movies. Uh-huh. I would uh-huh. rent out a Disney movie, and the kids would just on loop watch the VHS again, rewind again. They did it with Spy Kids because Spy Kids was on VHS uh-huh. as well, and they would just loop again and again and again. But now it's instant on their phone, on the yeah. car. They could just watch. I mean, I think my girls have seen uh, We Could Be Heroes a few times, at least two or three times. Uh, and I was like, I'll, I'll walk in the living room. That's like, great. Are you, are you what? Didn't you just see this like last week? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they have the ability to do that. Like, I can't yeah, yeah. watch a movie yeah. again and again. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. Mine it doesn't do that anymore. You know? Yeah, you know? Sure. It's like, it's I can't just watch like... Lethal Weapon like five times in a row. I can't really do that anymore. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's just like different the way they enjoy their entertainment. And it just, it was always kind yeah. of difficult to make to make that work but you know now it's easier than ever for them kind of i mean they don't really have much of a problem watching it on a phone or an ipad they just want to see it and like be able to watch experience it over and over again see the jokes again and you know right. so it's cool to put something in front of them that like really empowers them and shows them you know they can go on a really cool awesome adventure they can do really incredible things and if they work together with their family as well you know you can do you can move mountains and it's it's always been about that sort of thing too it's really special so and uh, we can be heroes, if I'm not mistaken, was like number one on Netflix for a, a while, right? For like a, a little, time, yeah. like for like a yeah. little, like it was like everybody was like, "What's going on? Like, what is, <laughs> what, what is this? Isn't Stranger yeah. Things? Like, what's going on?" Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. I'm like, "Good man, yeah. that's awesome." That, you know, it, was, it wasn't a, and I know the budgets because I know Robert, Robert didn't yeah. spend four hundred million dollars to make that. So yeah. I was like, "Good that a you know a, a film like that." gets that kind of attention worldwide yep. Yep. worldwide yeah. <laughs> yeah it's really it's really something uh, yeah. yeah it's absolutely. really interesting and I, and, super I, fun. And, yeah. and I believe that this one will probably do uh i hope do similar business if you will um, yeah. <laughs> so they can make yeah. the next two or three uh, and then your kids will start making them. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that's the yeah, that's the hope for us. You know, right now we're still waiting for the launch, and we're like, oh, I hope I just want to make a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth no. beyond this. So yeah, that's, exactly. Uh, I hope kids uh, connect something. with but it just as much as with as with We Can Be Heroes and all that kind of stuff because it's really. But great. if not, we really had a great time making it. It really brought the family together in a really fun way, and, and what's, we just um, are excited for people to watch it. And what was the biggest challenge of making that film? Because you know, making you guys, this one, yeah, yeah, because you guys have you got a little, a little bit of, different. You, guys, you, got some shrapnel. you got you got some shrapnel now. You got a little bit of shrapnel on you. You know, you've taken a couple hits along the way. Yep. How did this big, a little bit of bigger budget, slightly uh, yeah. bigger budget, <laughs> <You> <laughs> a little, little bigger than Red Eleven, <laughs> bigger, yeah. Yeah. a little bit. So, from a producing standpoint and a composing standpoint, how did this like biggest challenges you had to overcome? This one definitely the biggest challenge was uh, uh, dealing with a legacy. You know, of the oh, yeah. originals are so beloved that, yeah. and we just love them so much too, that crafting something that has to capture what came before 
that uh, that was always you know you put on your gloves to deal with that every single day just okay and now we're gonna uh, carefully adjust this and that and make sure this is feels up to snuff and so like reference of the originals was so key and so important and like in hindsight there's still little elements that i watch now in the movie and go gosh i wish i made that more like this or more like that because like oh i missed totally missed that whole side of fun that the originals had that ah oh, that i only incorporated a little bit so like that definitely is the biggest challenge but we're and that haunts you throughout writing, throughout production, through editing, even through visual effects. It's like, no, they're this composing. has to look the right shape. They're composing. <laughs> composing. <laughs> composing. Yep. Composing. All, all throughout all of it. That challenge haunts you throughout all of it. But at the end, I'm really happy with where it, how it came together and how I watch it and I see kids smile uh, sitting next to me and go, okay. You know, you can beat yourself up about like, oh, I wish you did this, this and that. But it really it captures something that's just like the originals and that made us smile as kids and makes us smile now as big kids so i never i never thought about that but you're absolutely right you guys are the the, the number one fans of this franchise <laughs> uh -huh. i mean yeah. and and the pressure that that puts on you guys as creators it's kind of like yeah you know, my parents started this train i, I better uh -huh. not derail it <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, glad I can, I'm glad i can say this now not at the beginning of the process you're like i can't do this i can't go down this road especially you know how many times this type of stuff hasn't worked out and you're like yeah. the odds are stacked against you for sure it's definitely <laughs> any sequel yeah. any sequel any sequel the yeah. second third or fifth yeah always has you're, you're always occasionally you get the terminator too occasionally yeah. you get yeah. aliens yeah, yeah you know, exactly. a, a cage. and by the way i actually like spy kids 2 more than i like spy kids 1 on a story oh, wow. uh, oh, that's oh, just my oh. personal i love spy oh, kids 1 awesome. but spy kids 2 i really remember liking it more i just liked that's it funny. more than the first one so oh, it, that's occasionally, that was my favorite it, too <laughs> right it's like occasionally yeah but man i can't imagine that kind of pressure because from your parents legacy from the film's legacy and also your own love of being part of it since you were so young must yeah. have been, I mean, how the hell did you make this movie? And like, I'm stressed out and I didn't even make them. Like, <laughs> sure. I think, yeah, definitely the stress and the weight and like the pressure of all of that is what counterbalances a lot is the love and the passion we've had for the series. And it's like, you know, we're like some of the biggest fans. So it's like, we were there the whole time going, it's got to have this, it's got to have a that, it's got to have this, you know, we need the vehicles, we need a little robot assistant because you can't go without that i mean that's all i, I wanted was, as a kid man. was a stinking robot assist i wanted ralph so badly <laughs> it needs this it needs that i mean i still need ralph sir i still need ralph, still need ralph <laughs> <laughs> yeah we if all you could tell me i could buy one i'd probably be looking towards that yeah i would 100 yeah. ralph is a necessity <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's definitely just as much as it was a huge deal and there was a lot to uh a lot to uh, get done here it was the passion for it was really what drove us and it was you know it's what made it probably one of my favorite projects we've done was that we get to do all that again and you know be able to add a new twist to it and add new flavors to it and we have That's enough such. under our belt that we are like we know how we can approach that in the writing and this and that you know we kind of put all our heads together and can try to do something new but still have that same feeling of, as the originals so it's really that's beautiful that's yeah. beautiful i think so, it came at exactly at the right time when i didn't feel i was ready for it but i had the passion <laughs> to like if i could do it this is how i'd do it and so you know so yeah. uh, now uh, moving on real quick you guys also worked on another little film called hypnotic uh uh -huh. recently you produced and you uh composed that uh again slightly bigger than red 11 um, a little bigger yeah yeah. I, uh, Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben Uncle was ben. the star. <laughs> Uncle Ben was the star. Ben. That's great. <laughs> so I mean, you guys, you guys are taking on bigger and bigger projects now. Um, you know, it it it's it's so admirable to see how you guys are taking on this kind of pressure because you could, I mean, you guys oh, could you. easily you could be, be all, all honest and no BS aside, you guys could coast comfortably for the rest <laughs> of your life. But no, no joke. You could like I could go oh. do this. But you guys are challenging yourselves and pushing yourselves as creators, as filmmakers. And I think that is a legacy of your parents who are pushing you and throwing you into the deep end. Because when I saw, like, because I'm like, oh, they did, uh -huh. we are the heroes. Are they? And then when I looked at them, I'm like, son of a, they did hypnotic too. Like, that's, that's a big, that's, that's a big, that's a big boy movie, you know, serious <laughs> movie, big boy movie, big girl movie, you uh -huh. know. So when you approach that, like, how did you guys, I mean, it's, 
it's a it's a bigger deal, guys. It's not, it's not <laughs> legacy. It's not legacy. It's not something yeah, else. Yeah. This you're like, okay, we're we're now in the deep end with Uncle Ben. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh man, absolutely. Um, it's yeah, as you were saying that we i as you were saying you guys are taking on the challenge the little voice in my head is going oh but i love the challenge and it's like in this moment in this chair i realized oh gosh my parents gave me a bit of their insanity yeah <laughs> this is that insanity that that gets the programming the hard. programming i talked to you about earlier this is <laughs> yeah. very subtle, subtle these two. very subtle these two <laughs> <laughs> they flipped it around the pressure and challenge that nobody wants they've made us like crave it and desire it and go after it as a day job <laughs> makes you more excited but it's that's really a kind of thinking that you know I mean, you become unbreakable in that regard. The more challenge yeah. you get, the more excited you are about it. It's like that's the passion can completely outgun the amount of pressure you have. And really, that's what generates the ideas. If you're not passionate for it, if you just feel like you're going to get steamrolled, nothing's going to come to you at all. But if yeah. you're <laughs> if you're if you got that rocky kind of mentality to it where it's like there's no way, you know, you just got to go the distance and give it everything you've got. You start coming up with stuff. The passion kind of drives it, and there, that's where you start to get the inspiration and the impetus to kind of start making something. And yeah, yeah. and it's, talk it's, about a challenge that makes you feel unbreakable uh, with hypnotic. It's like, yeah, this is a serious thriller. We have a uh, major great actor attached to this. Oh, and, and also an uh, also an Oscar winner and yes. a great director in his own right. A fantastic <laughs> director, absolutely right. fantastic director. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, on top of that. It was 2020. It was 2020 and 2021. We made this during a little something uh, called the pandemic. The global pandemic. The pressure. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. You guys are insane. This... <laughs> insane. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this project fell apart because of COVID twice. Each time, shrinking the budget as it went because uh, we this film was pre-sold. So all the budget that you have is all the budget you got. And twice we almost got it started, once in California, once in uh, Canada, but both times it fell through. And so we finally found a way to bring it over to a little home called Austin and uh, yeah. pulled out, well, believe it or not, pulled out a lot of our Red 11 tricks on this one. This <laughs> a good one, amount yeah. of the movie is shot in the exact same office studio as Red 11. <laughs> a good, we're like, how much, how can we use more of our own studio for this film? And just the fact that it's another it thriller. And it's got psychological aspects to it. It's, it's literally, we kept calling it, it's like the spiritual successor of like Red 11. Like Red 11 had a Desperado. It was weird. Like Mariachi had a Desperado. <laughs> right, it's really right. strange how that happened. Where it That's was like remarkable. So much of the same kind of DNA that made that was kind of had to put this out of necessity, but it made them so, it feel almost like they're linked spiritually a little bit. A weird sort of way. It's, so that it's is it, and it was it took all sides to do it you know we we're like okay well this is just a normal office but rebel with your incredible music that you've just learned how to compose we're going to <laughs> make this feel great and uh psychological and epic and moving and dramatic even though he's just walking through our same boring gray hall that we have in our studio <laughs> no pressure so, at yeah, all boys it's, it's no, no pressure, pressure at all <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah it, it was fun it was really fun to, you know, move on to something like that. That's, uh, as you said, big, big boy, big girl movie yeah, and yeah, man. Yeah. tackle it with all the same tool set that we've learned up to this point and gain new ones along the way. So I have to ask you guys uh, this question. What is the biggest if you can if you can bring it down to one thing, what is the biggest lesson you've learned from your dad? Biggest lesson I've learned from my dad. Filmmaking, um, film, filmmaking yeah. or life. It's up to you. <laughs> that's kind of the thing with him it's almost like the kung fu master is you don't realize he's teaching he's teaching you how to throw a punch but he's also teaching you how to pay your mortgage or how to yeah. <laughs> how to have a successful relationship right. Or, right or anything like that uh i always tell him this one is my favorite and is he taught me one day i think i was upset about something when i was five or six and he grabbed visuals are good for parents he grabbed a cup of water filled about halfway and it's a lesson we've all heard but you know, it just sticks with you. He spilled about halfway and he said, look at this cup of water. You can look at it. You can either see it as half full or half empty. What is it to you right now? And I said, it's half empty. Like there's only half water there. And he said, you just use a negative mindset. To me, I see a lot of potential in the little water that's in there. That's half full. I've got so much water to work with. I've got half full a cup of water. That's incredible. And he said, that is positive thinking. With that, I can conquer anything with think with believing I've got so much greatness in this little half full cup of water. I've got so much I can do. And 
he taught me that. I didn't tell him till probably like a decade later, 17, that that was the most important thing he ever taught me. And he went, I don't remember teaching you that. Really? Did I say that? <laughs> I don't I'm pretty that. good. I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Well, well, teach me. What did it, what did you get from it? But, <laughs> but that absolutely, you know, it's, it's filmmaking, it's life, it's everything. That kind of thinking, you, pressure and challenges don't turn into opportunity unless you can look at it in a positive way. Okay. So like all everything, I, I couldn't have learned anything I've learned either from them or from these projects that they've blessed us by putting us on and challenging us with unless I had that. So no, I'd definitely great. say it's, it's that one. probably one of the most foundational lessons that everything else builds on. It's like, if you have that, a lot of things can fall into place. It's, yeah. It was I mean, the same for you. It. It, was same like for, it, was, it was the same oh, for you. Yeah. It yeah, pretty much. That one's yeah. That's the one that's really. It's continued to mean more the more I grew up. It's like wow, this was that was really it. And um, I think the only the other one is his main one that you know, no matter how prepared you think you are, you're always going to everything's going to fall apart. He's, he said as much as knowing is half the battle, the other half of the battle is not knowing. And so it's just this kind of this eternal. You're never going to have the whole battle. Basically, it's just always you got to meet meet it the rest of the way, but. But um, yeah, definitely between those two, um, that's kind of been what's always driven us because it's really powerful. It allows you to turn mm -hmm. a monumental amount of pressure and problems into a monumental amount of potential. And for creativity, potential and passion is what makes it grow. So you just beautiful when you got nothing, you at least got your mind and like a piece of paper <laughs> and some ideas. <laughs> so <laughs> that takes no budget. But that's what the move the best movies are made out of it's all throughout it is so, that fabric so so if i may be able to quote dumb and dumber so you're saying there's a chance <laughs> <laughs> yep that's right. pretty much <laughs> yeah that's great <laughs> so um and on the other side of that coin of of, of your growth is your mother and mm -hmm. and the lessons that she taught I me mean, she's a remarkable producer uh remarkable. and holds the entire the entire place for you know when when your parents worked together and worked together early in their in their careers, she held the space for him to be, for him to be insane. Absolutely, uh -huh. without question, right? Yeah. So, and on Spy Kids, on the, on this one as well, she held the space so everyone could be insane. What lesson, if you could hold down to one, what is the lesson that your mother has taught you from not only on the filmmaking side but on the life side as well? Because you know, I you know I adore your mom. She's I, I adore uh -huh. her. She's she's, uh, she's amazing. But as a producer, I even respect her so much because what she does, she doesn't get a lot of limelight for. Her. No. And yeah, and for producers, sure. producers, producers, Razor, you, you will, you, will, you will, <laughs> producers, who, who, what? Ah, who cares? Yeah, who? It's, <laughs> it's about Uncle Ben and Robert. Yeah, it's yeah. like <laughs> when you Absolutely. when you know about them is usually because they were a huge problem. That's when you know about. That's when you <laughs> exactly. recognize them. So then you're like, yeah. oh, that producer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Exactly>. All right. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, where were in the Hollywood Hills? But uh, <laughs> so so yep. Yeah, so that that ability to hold space to protect your creators to hold a set to build a set. What advice? Can, what what? lesson did you learn from her on that aspect and also in life in general yeah, yeah for, her it's just, for her it's the same thing filmmaking in life you kind of learn one rule that applies to everything and with her it was that you adore her everybody who's worked with her loves her everyone. and it's everybody everybody everyone. everybody and so many uh so much that on this new spy kids we got to work together uh again and so i was producing and she was producing and i watched how much she's a mother on set and in production and in post and seeing how much as much as we talk about the myth of a guy went and did it all by himself no money none of this all by himself went and got it there are so many people in the background that led yeah, to something man. like that and it's so important yeah. to remember that all of them are family too they're just as much stewards of this creation right. as you the lone maverick are and they deserve all the love and all the respect and all the kindness you can give them to where they feel safe and that they can explore and that they can uh be creative and be insane so that sane foundation yeah. that allows them to grow and flourish that's what she taught me i see so many uh like i'm studying the secrets of so many other films and tv shows that i love and i do some digging do some digging and find 
people saying, oh my gosh, the production was lovely because like there was this one person who took care of all of us. And I go, oh, they had an Elizabeth Avian. And I read another yes. one. Oh, they had an Elizabeth Avian. Yep. Oh, they had an Elizabeth Avian. I believe it. So awesome. that would definitely be the biggest one. Yeah. yeah she always kind of mentions it offhand because she's, you know, raised five kids and all in quick succession while also making movies. And she always says it took a village to raise, to raise kids. I mean, it takes a whole team, but you hear her always say that it takes a village. I always catch her saying it on set too. And it's like, it's true. It takes a village to make a movie too. And it takes everyone being there. It's a whole team and it's all of us working together well and having a space where we can all be creative and bring our best to it. That really is what makes it, you know, that's kind of what she does. She sets the space for the magic to happen. And yeah, it's uh, and the insanity, <laughs> and the insanity, exactly, and the insa- exactly, and the insanity. And the, and the insanity. insanity. Oh, just... no, don't, don't get it twisted. Your mom's crazy too. I mean, oh, she's, she's got it too. Oh no, no, she's... oh no, 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 oh, yeah. no. no. A, she's got it too. She, <laughs> they're, they're, they all, they all got it. Different flavors, they got it. but yeah. there's, yeah. It, there's an insanity to all of this. Lovely Absolutely. insanity, but insanity to all of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, guys, Absolutely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. To ask all of my guests. Oh, please. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker or screenwriter starting in the business today, or trying to break into the business today? Mm-hmm, Don't mm-hmm. say make That's El Mariachi because I'll hit you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, someone asked that to Quentin at, uh-huh. at like Comic-Con or something like oh, that. Yeah. You know what he said? Make Reservoir Dogs. That's the only way I know how to do it. And I'm like, son of a man. Son of a man. <laughs> like, if only man. it were that easy, man. It's just, like, just write Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> ben do Pulp Fiction. I mean, that's it. That's the way I did it. That's so, that's <laughs> Absolutely. That's like, <laughs> yeah. you just go like that. Um, it's linear. You just build it's up. simple. Super For simple. Me. Yeah. Um, For me, it, it'd definitely be. Oh, yeah, you go there's it, yeah. the. Uh, uh, if you haven't, if you want to make films and you haven't made a feature yet, absolutely make a feature and absolutely make a feature. And most importantly, put restrictions on it, put time restrictions, put deadlines, put physical restrictions of what you can use, what you got. I'm not telling you to go make El Mariachi. I promise. Don't hit me, Alex. <laughs> as much as we talk about the importance of creativity and flourishing that and harnessing that, the, the, Dual side of that is you got to have your pants on fire a little bit. You got to have, you got to yeah. channel that insanity. You got to be a little bit crazy so that it gets done. Because I, I say, you're not a filmmaker until someone is sitting somewhere. It can be a couch at your house, it can be in a theater if you're that lucky or a screening room of some kind, if you make it that far. But you're not a filmmaker until the end credits are rolling and people around you have watched a full film you've made. In that moment, you're a filmmaker. That's and it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, whether they're running out of the theaters to go grab pitchforks and come chase after you, or if they're laughing, laughing their butts out harder than the left ever. It doesn't matter. The what matters is that you do that whole rep. Once you it's like doing half a push up and expecting that you've done one. It's no, you you can't filmmaking, it takes a long time to do a single push up, and you gotta get all the way to that to that moment for it to fully count. So that's what I would suggest. Beautifully yeah. said, sir. I will not be hitting you. Rebel, oh, <laughs> now, now it's your turn. You're still on the block. Go ahead. <laughs> <You're> so- <laughs> um, Adding to that. Yeah, so that's the first thing we've learned. I've never learned more in my life than I have when there was a deadline when you've got the pressure. That's when, I don't know, I think it turns into kind of fight or flight. That's when you feel like, yeah. the, okay, we yeah. got to move. It's something has to be done by now. Even if you made up the deadline, it's something has to be done now. But my own one is... I think the most important thing, too, is if you're, you know, you want to get into the business, you have these ideas, you know, because, again, like you said, we're all geniuses. We have this incredible <laughs> thing in our head. <laughs> Just start. Make something. It does. I don't care what it is. Start. Don't go and wait till you've got, you know, Terminator or till you've got Avatar and you've written the whole thing and you can create this monstrosity. Make something. It doesn't have to be very big, but make at least start doing it and do a whole rep, even if it's a little one. Do one show people now you officially made a movie so it's most people never even start they're like i want to do it but i need blank i have this i haven't done this i don't have that you know it's you don't need anything just start and you will pick up the pieces that you need along the way and at least then you've started doing it which most people don't even get there so just by showing up the first day you've started the process now you'll get momentum if you're standing around waiting for inspiration or momentum it's not going to happen so you gotta. I, f- I feel the. I feel like there's like a spirit of Robert 
in the room now <laughs> like and he's like channeled through youtube at the moment because it's <laughs> it sounds so it sounds so beautiful and both of you guys said it's absolutely right and where were you guys like 15 years ago for me because i wish i would have heard this 15 years ago all <laughs> wow. i did was throw Thank obstacles you. in front of myself mm, right. and that's what a mm -hmm. lot of filmmakers do they're like oh i can't mm -hmm. do it until i have this camera i can't do it until this person's there i can't do yeah. it until i have this location and it's excuses yeah. because they're either scared or have some trauma like I did, which is a whole other story, uh, or other stuff like that that stops you from going forward until you finally get mm -hmm. to the place where you're like, screw it, I'm going to go to Sundance and make a movie. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. right, for sure, absolutely. You, you, know, had, gonna, yeah. you had the time of your life doing it. And as a oh result, my God. I'm sure oh. it came out, I'm sure you could feel the vibrancy in it as a result. If it, you know, with what you came out with, it's just going to, it's got this energy to it because you were excited, you drove it. It's just the fact they said, screw it, we're going to make a movie. There you go. You started. You're doing something now. Even if it's with your phone, you're going around and doing something at least. And that's it's, the big it, difference. It's, it's really very good. powerful. It's really a powerful mm -hmm. idea to just get going and get yeah. started. But the, I think the one thing that's missing from this this little bit is the attachment to um, what happens to it. The attachment uh -huh. to, oh, I have to make this. That was the biggest thing. Like, yeah. and. El Mariachi was the best and the worst thing that ever happened to a whole generation of filmmakers, as sure. as was Clerks, as was Slacker, as all of those of, the, of that generation is like, oh, when I make my first film, it has to be Reservoir Dogs. Right. Mm -hmm. It has to be Mariachi. It's got to be Clerks. And that pressure, you're just destroying yourself yeah. before you even get off the, you can't walk with that kind of weight on you. Yeah, you know? exactly. And mm -hmm. you learned early on that you don't have to do that because you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I right. imagine that as filmmakers, the pressure that was on you guys. I mean, we talked a little bit about on Spy Kids too, but you know, you've got two very large shadows. That, you, but you're like, screw it, I'm doing me, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. They did what they did. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And it took me to just say, I'm 40. <laughs> I gotta. I mean, what am I gonna wake up tomorrow? I'm gonna be 60. I'm gonna still do it with this BS. I gotta make something. And I've been directing for 20 years, but I hadn't uh, made the feature yet. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that was. And that was the thing. So then, once I made, and once you make the one, it's good, bad, and different. Doesn't matter. You're like, okay, I proved to myself I can make one. Great. Mm -hmm. And now I can move forward. And it doesn't have to be Reservoir Dogs. Because no. no one's gonna make Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> no one yeah. ever will make Clerks or Reservoir Dogs. I mean, Brothers yeah. McMullen, <laughs> you know, Boys in the Hood. Yeah. No one's going to make <laughs> those movies again, ever, yeah. ever. So once you get that out of your head, then mm -hmm. it, it frees you to be the creative, the creative yeah. forces that you two are now. Yeah. So oh, thank you. <laughs> that is, I, I that is the other agree. aspect. That's, yeah. That is the, uh, the missing key of the triumvirate right there. I absolutely yeah. agree. If there was, if, if there was a, a worst day you've ever been on a production, what was that day? And how did you overcome it? Oh, that's a good one. Ooh. <laughs> Let's see. I gave the raining, raining on our climax story. Gosh, what's another? Hmm. I know there's one on Spy Kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I assume Rebel, when you're when you're composing, I mean, a hard drive might have crashed here and there, uh, or or you could <laughs> or, or you get blocked from. It's it's almost always scene. mental. It's almost always mental. It's and it almost happens on every single one of them. I'm going to say and oh, that's another thing I'll point out in a second. But yeah, it's it was heroes. This is the first time it really hit it was we can be heroes. I wrote that entire score because it was like a blessing and a curse. I wrote the huge battle sequence for the parents fight the aliens and all. That. I wrote that. That was one of the first things I wrote for that. That was like after almost a year of learning orchestral music, I'd never written for an orchestra. So I was spending a year writing pretty much garbage. I hit that and I was like, that's great. And Robert was like, well, the good news is that's really great music. That's incredible. You know, I could never write at that level. The bad news is I can't help you on this anymore. You got to do the whole movie yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> he's like, I'm not going to help you because you have I now can't, surpassed it's not the master. Sound... You have yeah. surpassed the master. I can't help like, you anymore. Yeah. Good luck. He's like, it's not going to sound the same. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, it's just suerte. Get in there. Wow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, suerte. Vaya con Dios. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it was four months of music. I composed for four months on that one. And it's 90, it's like 85, 90 minutes of music. All That's orchestra. a lot of music, brother. An That's hour a lot and a half of music. Of music. Yeah. That's and a lot of music. I was halfway through. It was like two and a half months. I think it was actually more than halfway. Two and a half months in. And I had written one third of it going as fast as I could go. Wow. 
And that's when it dawns on you. I don't think I'm gonna make it, dude. And it's all mental. You're just up all night, just sitting there going, dude, it's done for. I'm gonna sink this whole movie. <laughs> oh yeah, you start going down the yeah. rabbit hole. Yeah. You start yeah. you're, you're, you're circling you're the, the drain. Guy. You're circling the drain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole movie's been made. Everyone's done their things. High fives. You saw everyone was so excited when the set was over. We did it. It's amazing. The edit, it's all coming together. You're the last guy there. I mean, you're just like, they're all like, all right make the last leap, you know, you're right there. And it's like, I don't think I'm going to make it. And I don't know, something clicks there you know, where you go into overdrive. It's one of these scariest kinds of things because the way I say it is the more ideas you create, the more impetus you're going to get on the project. Cause you're kind of figuring it out. Like the puzzle piece of it, what's the style of it. What's this, what's that just keep making, don't stop. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad, don't judge it. Just keep making stuff because you're going to have more to work with. And so it, you start a movie, at least a score, and it's halfway through and you haven't made half. You've made like a third, maybe, maybe even less. But Ugh. it almost like multiplies until by the end, you're writing like 10 times faster than you were at the beginning because you've just figured out more of the movie. So it always feels like you're down to the wire pretty much. But that was the first time I ever experienced it. And there's always that moment where it dawns on you. It's like Rocky where he's like, I can't do this. You know, I'm just going to go the distance. I It's... And it's, it's one of if it could either break you or it can make you definitely. It's one of those moments where you either quit and say, I can't do it, man. You're going to have to hire someone else or you just drive through and it, you know, it's barely make it by the skin of your teeth. It's you like, know, what's <laughs> you know, what's fascinating is like I've, I've done, I don't know, a thousand episodes at this point. I've, I've had composers on before, but I've never had a composer at your level that's able to do these large movies or have ha have the opportunity to these large movies uh -huh. and this relay race pressure because you're the last leg of the race yeah and if you so fumble remember. yeah if you fumble the damn baton it's all over no matter how fast the other guys were you're done that pressure uh, is something i've never really thought about for a composer because a lot of the composers i've talked to like you know oscar winners are big guys who've done this a thousand times but you're just like i've never talked to them about like the beginning <laughs> aspects of their career just like I was on a seventy million dollar movie, and I, yeah. I was just like, <laughs> I didn't think I was yeah, gonna make dude. it, and yeah. I had no one around me to help. Like I'm yeah. alone. By yeah. Suerte. Like, yeah, like exactly. <laughs> exactly. that's it. So I that's did really it. remarkable. I'm here, to, I'm here today. I survived somehow. I it's a blur, but yeah, and, it happens, and it's gonna happen every single movie. That's all I've found. I come back. You think, oh, you're on top of the world. That's it. No, it's like Rocky. He comes back. He can't do it again. You got to start from that from scratch again. You're like, I don't think I can do this one because this, I this and that. Oh, this this one's hypnotic. It's kind of I mean, it's got, you know, Ben Affleck. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we don't have an orchestra. They carried the way. I mean, they do amazing work. You write this stuff, you give it to them. They make it sound incredible. It's all on me. What comes out of my computer is what's going to be on the movie. And it's like, I don't know if I can do this again. And it's like, you, you just, it, you get in your head and it's over. So it's, yeah, every single time I've hit it, it's just. Yeah. That's beautiful because it's like, like, you know, am I going to have to go down to the, to the dungeon of Apollo and train again? Like, am I, <laughs> am I like, it's like, cause I just can't, obviously Mr. T is too much for me. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to make it. I think I've been broken and now I have to come back. So it's, it's similar. So your Mr. T was like, this is Ben Affleck, man. This is Movie, you know, yeah. I don't know what the hell I'm yeah. gonna do, man. That glass and of I, water better be half full, man, because it's <laughs> the only thing you got. Oh my gosh, yeah, uh, that's, that's <laughs> remarkable. Well, that's that's great, man. Thank you for that story. That's I've just <laughs> never oh, really nice. thought about that aspect of yeah, right. compose. Yeah. I've been in post most of my life, so I've always been mm. at the end, mm. and I always figure it out, and I always you know post in, and I've been post supervisor VFX, all that kind of stuff. So I always just figure it out along the way. But mine's is technical on that sense. Maybe the creative with editing and stuff, but. I'm not, I'm not alone a lot of times. I have either a producer or you're out there in an island by yourself and there's just a phone call. Oye, ¿dónde está la música? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, basically. Yeah, That's amazing. That's amazing. It's pretty incredible. So, Razor, how about you, my friend? Uh, I'll just tack on to what he said because it's excellent. We're just... There's really... I've been fortunate. We haven't had really anything bad. You know, we've had things explode. We've had... Sure, sure. It's sick. We had every, everything that could be considered bad, but it's like it's never been really that bad because you just do what Rebel said there. Movie set standards. 
happens all the time. And <laughs> all the time. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Whether it's, oh, God, the wind is kicking up so high on our fin- hypnotic finale that none of the actors can see because sand is blowing in their eyes. So we got to close out this finale as quick as we can Let's, yeah. and make it emotional somehow because we're in a dry river basin in COVID and we can't go anywhere else. Or it's like, oh, gosh, it's 105 degrees outside and our little actor star is just not having this heat he is having a horrible time <laughs> and he's got to deliver some lines right now unless we can cut him cleverly right now watch this i'll draw do a little drawing and i'll show you how we can fix this so as rebel said you you start getting your head the most important thing you can do is get out of your head quickly start making it tangible start making tangible solutions no matter what it is whether it's the boat sinking it's- vehicle's gone actor can't make it you have to rewrite the entire scene just start drawing start writing start talking to everybody that's there to help you and figure it out get out of your head beautiful, quickly beautiful beautiful advice guys now um if you had a chance to go back in time and talk to little Ooh. rebel and little racer what <laughs> advice would you give them <laughs> that's funny yeah i've actually had one of those yeah have, do you have a time machine dude seriously can i borrow it like I have a lot there's a lot of i can fix I, there's a lot of stuff i need to work on yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i actually uh, yeah on uh on spy kids i had this one actually we were uh we were in london and recording for the we we're there for the orchestra to go record it live because the whole thing's live recorded and uh mm-hmm. It was up there that I wrote it down and I was telling the race. We're always just talk ideas about this kind of stuff. And it's just, I told them, I think I finally have something I would have like gone back a few years and wish I told myself <laughs> like <laughs> really, really like, man, I wish I knew this five years ago, man. <laughs> but it's uh, it's an interesting kind of trap you you fall into because you're doing what you love. It's not what you really expect is um, I loved making music. I mean, it was like everything to me. I was just out of school. Now you've got all the time, you know, all the time you could possibly think of. You, you've got a part time job or whatever. You've got so much time as opposed to when I was in school. And it's like you're squeezing out whatever little bit you got that isn't school time. And um, I think the worst thing you can do is be so passionate about it that you put all of your time into it and are willing to put in an unbelievable amount of hours into it constantly and do every little last little touch and try to make the most perfect thing you can make because it's not at all how reality works. I, honestly, it's, it's almost <laughs> yeah. like you need, and it's like, it was always weird. I make things and I would just get so into the details and almost lost in the details to where you're not really doing the broad strokes well and all that kind of stuff, because I had so much time. It's like, Oh, well I can sit here and do this all day and, you know, mess with every little note I write and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's actually counterintuitive. It teaches you all the wrong ways to do things in a weird way. I'd watch my dad work and, Robert just has kind of this thing of like, well, I've only got this many hours. Let's just hit it and let's do it. And he just dives right in. And he, I mean, he's making broad strokes pretty much, but you see how he's not afraid to make mistakes. He's not afraid to make something that it doesn't seem like it's perfect to him. And it's almost like when he's mostly focusing on those broader strokes, he gets a big, he gets a, uh, a better result from it. It's almost like a bold. I call that uh, line confidence. When you're an artist and you draw, if you're just trying to make every like line really perfect, they actually end up kind of scrib- scribbly. If you've seen a great artist, they're just like, like nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, they're just throwing them out there and you watch Robert. He does the same thing. I went up and got to work with, we got to work with John Debney on this again, who did the music for Spike It's two. He did, he mm-hmm. helped Spike It's one, all that kind of stuff. I mean, he kind of helped birth the Spike It sound, but I watched him compose. I like never gotten to see like a professional composer actually in the midst of writing. And he's just like, all this stuff, I had like put all this time and attention to detail to. Oh, I do this because I have all this time. He's just like glancing over it. Like, and what he's focusing on is so different than what I was focusing on because he doesn't have time. He doesn't put a lot of time into it. He's like, well, in one hour, I got to get the scene done. Swish, swash, you know, does all that. And versus me, I've got eight. I could put all the time in the world I want in this. And you focus on all the wrong things. It teaches you to not look at the right things. If you give yourself a little time, this kind of goes into the deadline thing. Um, you actually focus on what's the most important thing that'll make the most impact. And that's where you start to make some real progress. So it was once I've started to do that, I really started after I watched him write like that, I was like, oh, that's how you write. All my music was, I mean, literally like leaps and bounds improved. 
So I mean, the, the old guys have a couple of tricks. I'm gonna say, <laughs> really? us, us, us old guys old man have strength. a couple. It's old like, man strength, yeah, baby. It's, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it's weird. It's like so counterintuitive because you're like, I'm so passionate about this. How could I just now be so apathetic towards it? And it's like it's not yeah. apathy so much as it's like you have to learn how to just let it flow. You got to have that confidence in your strokes and just you know Beautiful. move with it. And it's almost more important to put more ideas out there rather than barely squeeze out one because you finally thought it was perfect. You know, get out of your head, throw down too many. It's way better to have too much stuff. I mean, he would just overdo it. He'd put in too much and go, that was too much. And he'd back it off. At least now you found out where the ledge was. If you kept tiptoeing forward, blindfolded, you never know where that ledge is. And take you forever to get there. Exactly. So it's, that was really, really important. (laughs) Great. Uh, Another good answer, sir. Razor? Uh, first off, I would take the entire recording of this podcast and just play it to a 17 year old racer. Like, you're going to listen to this. You're going to memorize every single word that is said here by all three of these people talking right now. <laughs> Start with that. That's book one. Appreciate book that. T- book two. You're going to, you're out of high school now, little 18 year old racer. Okay. You're going to take a whole year off. You're going to take a gap year. What you're going to do is you're going to make a feature. You have one year to do it. I don't care how you do it. But it's got to be done in one year, and I dare you to make it good. It can't be, you can't make it, you can't be good and go over time. You have to try to strive for some level of greatness, and you have to, but you have to finish it. It has to be done by the end of this. And uh, put some of your time into it, as Rebel said. Don't put all 16 hours of your day into it. Give yourself a a work day, eight hours, six hours, whatever you can manage. Then go take time for family, for friends, all of that stuff, because that's important too. You got to take care of all the other sides of your life because now you're dealing with adult things too. And make that happen. That'll teach you more than anything combined. And of course, most important thing, make it with what you got. Because with one year, no money, you don't have time for, you don't have, there's nothing you can get for that. So do it with what you've got. That's that's what I would say. And finally, the last question, and arguably the most difficult one I've asked in this entire conversation. Oh, wow. Each of you, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, I, oh actually. <laughs> this, I always keep my list ready. It's, like, uh, re- By the way, everyone who's just listening to this, Rebel just grabbed this phone. I was like, okay, let me just pull out my list. And... <laughs> I actually just did this. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, guys. I keep my top five on hand. So I've okay. got... Um, Excalibur, 1981, John nice. Borman's. That's my Beautiful. top of the top favorite. Absolutely. Beautiful. It has everything I love. When you see the new Spy Kids, you might see some influence. <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, <laughs> absolutely love it. Uh, number two, uh, The Incredibles, uh, oh, Pix- classic God. Pixar. Talk about VHS as you would watch on infinite repeat. That, that was the first time where I watched a movie all the way to the end, went through the end credits because they're incredible, the music and everything. Michael Giacchino just killing it. And I watched it all and I just hit reset and i went i think this is one of my favorite movies this is the only one i've ever done this on and then uh number three is a uh, old boy absolutely love love the style from the early 2000s it's got a style that all my favorite like video games and like tv shows had at the time that's so, like this y2k dark futurism absolutely love it so, so those are my top three the great top three and i have to i just tell you a geek story real quick oh, i was please, at please. sundance at a midnight screening of Old Boy in the wow. U.S. premiere of Old Boy, wow. while he, while the director was there, he'd wow. just flown in from Japan. Wow! And I met wow. him, and he was like half asleep because the poor guy just flew over <laughs> from <guy>. Japan. <laughs> just, and I remember wow. seeing Old Boy at Sundance at, at the uh, at the uh, uh, the main theater there, the um, Egyptian. And uh-huh. I'm like, what did I just watch? watch. Like it was like. <laughs> What insanity is this? I was it was it was one of those moments I'll never forget. I'll never I forget. I believe that. it. At a so, midnight screening. <laughs> at a midnight screening at Sundance with the director just flying in from Japan. Uh, like he he hadn't gotten there yet when the movie started. He was there at the end for a QA and a and then I uh, met him outside. Outside everyone was gone already. I'm like, "So, how are you?" He's like and his interpreter was there and it was like uh, crazy. That's crazy. so cool, dude. That's crazy. amazing. Oh my god. <laughs> Envious. Sorry, that's I had to amazing. Th- had to, had that's to throw awesome. that little geek story out that's there. So I've cool. got, I got a few geek stories along the way, but oh, that's man. Uh, one of the benefits <laughs> well, mine, of being an old man. For more. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot of cool stories, that's for sure. Uh, that's Re- awesome. Rebel, how about you? How's your top, uh, top three? Um, all of his three are also my favorites, but I pulled out some extra other ones as well. We love those, but um, definitely 
one of my top favorite favorite animated at the moment right now across the spider verse that was inc- oh, i absolutely so loved it that was so incredible beautiful. i mean it's just it's changing beautiful. the game of animated we love incredibles but it's really cool to see something now that's like shoot that's like another incredibles to some degree like and it's, it's just a way. whole other level it's, it's like, like when like, i yeah. when i watched just, that i was like i mean what is going on <laughs> it's really impressive <laughs> yeah, beautiful. um yeah. i'm a deus that's a classic i love that one a lot and oh, now man. i love it more because i make music the more i've learned the more i appreciate it that, that I'm like, laugh oh that's so cool. yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my god like the more you learn Amazing. about music the more you're just like it's crazy. They captured like the genius of it so well. I mean, it's just oh, it's like, such it's a, so a masterpiece. Great. I mean, masterpiece. It's, it's really masterpiece. Masterpiece. That one's just fantastic. And then um, Tide, either Jaws, that's another classic. Always love that one. Music on that one's great. Uh, I've always been a big fan of that. Been playing it on piano since I was like, you know, however young I was. Our, our dad introduced us to the Jaws theme, but we didn't know what the movie was. So I was just there, dun 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 dun. You know, <laughs> dun, 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 yeah. uh, he played the music in the car, and he was like, "You'll see it someday." And it's like. That was it. That's all I knew. But <laughs> um, and what's up, Doc? I love love that oh, comedy. Wow, yeah. nice. That's great. Nice. A great comedy. Great yeah. comedy. So so great. So I noticed your dad didn't make the list, but that's fine. That's fine. I'm sure his ego <laughs> will be fine with that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <joking>. <laughs> I Is would it, I would have been like Sin City. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, right? like, guys, seriously, dude, seriously. He drank the Kool-Aid. So I'm glad he's that you got- did not put any of your father's films up there. <laughs> he's, he's got a special list. It's like, yeah. it almost doesn't count. because like. Yeah. So, us, let me, so let me what, ask you this. What is your favorite dad film? You go oh. first, Rebel. Just to make sure I don't pick the same one. No, you go for it because I know we're going to pick the same one. I'll, I'll pick a different oh, one. Oh, okay. It. Top three. Top, um, three oh, actually, uh, top three Robert films in your world. Uh, cool. Number one, Road Racers, his second film. Yes, of course. I think so great. Incredible. I love the rebel spirit of it. So, so good. Um, then for me next, it's uh, Desperado. I just love what he did with El Mariachi and just like complete spiritual successor that just blew even more heads in the first one. Incredible. And then uh, Spy Kids 2, honorable mention. My favorite, my absolute favorite of the Spy Kids. So I love the fantasy and the creatures and the fun. And they have the best outfits in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Really? Um, Road Racers is a very big favorite of ours. Sin City, though, is another one. Definitely. I loved watching that one. Um, he always puts off showing us his movies. We just wait till he wants to show it to us. That one we watched like at midnight, practically. We finished. It was like 2 a.m. And he was like, hey, let's make the breakfast tacos from the five minute cookies. Cool. Ten minute cookies. <laughs> we made those ate them at like 3 a.m. <laughs> oh, we just so we could ta- ask some questions. And, like, yeah, but that was so that's super memorable for me. And then, um, Definitely, and Mariachi as well, and Desperado. So those are just. I, if I if I, I may love. throw my if I may throw mine into the ring, go for it. For I'd love to hear. Yeah. I think Desperado was uh, because I was in film school when Desperado came out. Uh, I saw great. it in the theater. I saw it in the theater, uh, and I saw I had that poster in my 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 room, at right in here, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. with with uh, Uncle Antonio, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and that gun that was just amazing. Yeah. That double barrel, yeah, like, the, the like the a double barrel off, shotgun. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Second, yeah. I'm going to say Desperado because that was the one that really, um, that one really hit me. Sin City, um, yeah. Yeah. without question. Absolutely. You look at Sin City, and you're just like, I don't, I don't even, what the <laughs> I don't even going know, on, man. man. It's I crazy. Don't even know. It's so great. <laughs> and believe it or not, um, one of the other films that I really loved of his is Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Oh, it's classic. It's, it's excellent. Because Once Upon a Time in Mexico, for me, was the film that got me off to wow. make my first big short film that wow. went on and did it, it did insane things for me and I had Roger wow. Ebert review it and it was a whole thing uh, back that's in the great. day. That's awesome. But it all started with Once Upon a Time in Mexico when I saw the Wacamole gun. Right. That was my task. I, I, I saw the Wacamole gun and I saw that and I was like, I think I could do this now. Like it was mm-hmm. like there was so much per, like for sure. obstacles that you put in your yeah. head. But that was the movie that just kind of pushed me over. So it has a special place in my heart for that was the movie that kind of launched my filmmaking side not the commercial or music video side that i've been doing but more the filmmaking filmmaking side was that that was the film that kind of did it for me so those those are my that's top great. three that's classic wow that's awesome that's, that's great. great i love those picks yeah. there's just so much to choose from it's just all great oh no again yeah. they're their own that's their own category you can't even yeah. put them yeah, in the top exactly <laughs> Boys, I, I truly appreciate this conversation, man. It has been such a pleasure and honor talking to both of you. You are your energy is infectious. 
I want to go make a feature now. I don't know why, All right. <laughs> but uh, I need to, I'm going to go shoot something. I don't know when, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> uh, figure, just figure it out. Just, just go. No, y- your, your energy is infectious. Uh, and, and this has just been such a pleasure of a conversation. And I do believe I agree with you, Racer. I think that filmmakers will get a whole lot out of this conversation. There's a lot of gems in this. And I hope it helps people around the world kind of maybe demystify a little bit of the myth and really get into the weeds of how you actually make these films and actually do this kind of process, the mariachi process, if you will, mm-hmm. um, without the myth as much overheading because yep. <laughs> you guys kind of cut through the myth really quickly and like, no, nah, we don't know. And, and this, I don't know. <laughs> and so, so it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you guys so much. Oh, by the way, where can people right. watch Spy Kids? Spy Kids will be on Netflix coming at the end of September. Very soon. Very, very soon. Yeah. Very ah, excited. Well, Please. If you're, if you're a fan, if you've grown up, if you have kids, please, please, I would love for you to see it. And even if you've never heard of Spy Kids, go check them all out. They're all excellent. Classic, classic films. And do you have, do you guys have any parting messages for any young racer or young rebel out there <laughs> who's thinking about getting into this insanity carnival <laughs> circus, ridiculous business that we're all in? Any parting messages for them? <laughs> absolutely i please jump in whether you want to do animated or live action or shows or whatnot please jump in because stories and films stories are how one of the methods that humans get truth from the world and i want to see the truths that you can put into the world and teach all of us about and you're never going to make a mariachi or as our dogs or clerks or any of those but i don't want to see that from you i want to see your film I want to see what you can make. Rebel? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, shoot. Let me think about that a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you're thinking about that, I do have to say something. This is kind of the elephant in the room. You guys both have the greatest names ever. Um, <laughs> I know. I know, it wasn't, I know it wasn't your mom. I know it wasn't your mom. <laughs> your mom just allowed it. But it, <laughs> because I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I I try. I already started. I started a, pro, a propaganda campaign with my wife when well, I was going to have kids. I'm like, if I have a boy, he has to be Maximus Ferrari. Max Ferrari. Max, come Max on, Ferrari has to be. Has come to. on, has to be. dude. That's so Max cool. Ferrari but yet I had. To. But luckily, I had girls. So, <laughs> 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 but it would have been—I would have had so, a fight. It would have maximum. The world Ferrari. was spared of a Max Ferrari. A Max <laughs> Ferrari. Another generation. Can you imagine, Can you imagine <laughs> awesome Max Ferrari? That would have been amazing. <laughs> that's yeah. That's too. You can't. You can't pass that up. <laughs> Believe so it great. or not, it, it, a little little mom's insanity. Uh, Racer Max was chosen because my mom had a crush on Racer X when she used to watch Speed Racer. Oh, <laughs> so, <yeah>. really? <laughs> yep. So uh-huh. she she came up with the name first, and and or dad came up with she, it. He, uh, they both thought Racer would be fun after Rocket, and uh, and then Rebel was going to be my name too. But I was like, ah, oh, it's not a Rebel. I think this is a Racer, and came up with the middle name with uh, with uh, uh, Tia Salma <laughs> of all people. Racer, like I said, <laughs> insane. Local. Insane. Yep. <laughs> Todo loco. Todo. All of the whole clan. All of your nuts. Uh, <laughs> uh, anything you want to add, Racer? No pressure. Um, yeah. So I think definitely if you're going to dive in, like Racer said, do so. It's amazing. It's it's Creative work is one of the most gratifying kinds of things ever. I mean, it's nothing opens your mind more like creativity. But definitely learn to love the process and all that it is. It's all the good all the bad, all the crazy days, learn to see it half full, learn to enjoy all of it because no matter how big and famous you get or how much you stay right where you are, it's all going to be the same the whole time. There's just more money, so there's more people and there's more problems, there's more of the same thing. So enjoy and love the process for what it is and how gratifying it can be and and exciting that you you don't always know what's going to come your way. So definitely learn to love the process. So like P. Diddy says, more money, more problems. I understand. I understand. That's, that's what I got out of that. That's what I got. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> guys, yeah. it, again, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show and continue uh, this gener- the next generation of Rodriguez Insanity. So I appreciate you guys. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, man. So Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the yeah. time. I really Thank appreciate you. it.